Today, the House Government Reform Committee examined projected revenue shortfalls at the U.S. Postal Service. Testifying before the panel, Postmaster General William Henderson, David Walker from the General Accounting Office, and members of the Postal Board of Governors. Indiana Republican Dan Burton chairs this three-hour and 20-minute hearing. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. Would uh, everybody take your seats and can you shut those doors back there yes, so that the noise from outside no, will be just, uh, disconcerting to those in the committee? We expect a vote on the floor on the journal probably in about 15 minutes, so we'll get started with opening statements. And uh, after that, uh, we'll probably have to break for the vote, but we won't we'll only be gone for about 10 minutes. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform uh, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I want to welcome everyone to this hearing of the Government Reform Committee. We're here today to examine the current financial condition of the Postal Service. As part of the reorganization of our committee structure for the 107th Congress, postal issues will be handled at the full committee level. As most of you know, I'm a veteran of the old Committee on Post Office and Civil Service. I've been extremely active on postal issues for many years. Representative John McHugh, the former chairman of the Postal Subcommittee, did an outstanding job for six years working on postal reform. I intend, along with Mr. Waxman, to conduct a vigorous oversight of the Postal Service, and uh, through that oversight, uh, we'll work to ensure affordable, universal postal service. The Postal Service is the only government agency that touches the lives of virtually every household and every American in this country. In other words, every citizen has a stake in the future of the Postal Service. The service employs over 900,000 people to deliver more than 668 million pieces of mail every day. At the outset, let me say that I'm concerned about the news coming out of the Postal Headquarters. They're predicting a two to three billion dollar loss this fiscal year, the same year that they just raised postal rates. My first reaction was disbelief, especially in view of the fact in the last couple of years there's been a surplus. My second reaction was grave concern when I was informed that the Postal Service intends to file for another rate increase in just a few months. In the past, I have been critical of the Postal Service because of their first response to every financial shortfall appears to be to raise rates. An increase of the magnitude proposed between six and eight billion dollars total revenue is astronomical. That represents a 10 percent increase in overall revenue. This kind of increase would drive businesses away from the Postal Service. Some mailers would be forced to seek alternative means of communication. Others very well could be driven into bankruptcy. I view this as a slippery slope for the Postal Service. This rate increase, combined with a revenue drain being caused by the information technology revolution, spell long-term trouble for the service. The alternative to raising rates is to do what every private sector business does when its sales declines, cut costs and increase quality service. You know, if uh, General Motors or Chrysler has financial difficulties and their sales drop, they don't raise the cost of the car to make up for the, the deficiency. They try to figure out ways to streamline, to economize and to make sure that they're going to be competitive in the marketplace. That same principle should be applied to the Postal Service. The alternative to raising rates, as I said, is to do what every private sector business does when its sales decline, and that is to cut costs and increase service quality. Today, I hope to hear a specific plan from Postmaster and Postmaster General about what steps are being taken to reduce expenses. The Postal Service has announced plans to immediately freeze capital commitments or improvements to postal facilities. This will reportedly save about a billion dollars. More cost containment options must be examined. Nothing should be off of the table. Another rate increase should be the last option and not the first. 
today i'm calling on the postal service to work together with all stakeholders to examine all possible ways to cut costs i'm confident that we can find sa the savings without affecting the quality of mail service if we can succeed with significant cost containment this will allow the postal service to push back the filing for the next rate increase or to eliminate it entirely the current economic slowdown adds to the dire financial straits in which the Postal Service finds itself. However, the larger long-term problem is the regulatory model that is nearly three decades old. It does not provide the Postal Service with the flexibility needed to succeed in a rapidly changing market. Again, I want to pay tribute to my colleague John McHugh. John labored for years trying to develop legislation to fix the Postal Service before the crisis hit. Well, John, it looks like you're the only guy in this room who has the right to say I told you so. I think this situation is akin to the current energy crisis occurring in California. Nobody took the steps necessary to fix the problems early on. Now we have rolling blackouts and price spikes. We're in the early stages of a similar crisis in the Postal Service. If we take the necessary steps now to fix the problems, maybe we can avoid a full-blown crisis over the next few years. I'm sure there's some naysayers in this room who believe that the information technology revolution is not real, that advertisers are not moving over to the internet, that consumers are not going to pay their utility bills online, and that none of this supposed change will have an impact on the postal service and the revenues. These folks remind me of people who said the, the entertainment industry would never replace silent movies with the newfangled talkies. Today, we will be hearing from a number of distinguished witnesses to examine the current financial problems at the Postal Service. Our first witness is the head of the General Accounting Office, the watchdog for the legislative branch, Comptroller General David Walker. General Walker has had a team of experts working to help this committee analyze the data we're receiving from the Postal Service. Our second witness is a man I want to pay a special tribute to, Postmaster General Bill Henderson. General Henderson is completing his tenure at the helm of the Postal Service. He's presided over a period of great turmoil, a time of some detours, a few potholes, but also much progress. I want to thank you, Bill, for your 30 years of service to the country. Our last panel will consist of five members of the Board of Governors of the Postal Service. In addition to directing and controlling the expenditures of the Postal Service, the Board has the difficult task of selecting the new Postmaster General. I welcome all of our witnesses and look forward to their testimony. Before I yield to uh, Mr. Waxman, let me say that I have discussed briefly with him the need to work out a bipartisan solution to this crisis. And he's uh, extended his hand of friendship to me, and uh, we're going to try to do our best to see if we can't come up with a bill that will solve the problems that we're facing. I believe he feels this is a necessity as, as well as I do. Hopefully, with bipartisan support, we can reach agreement. Toward that end, I would like to suggest that all segments, and this is very important, I hope everybody listens to this part, because we as legislators can't do this by ourselves. Toward that end, I would like to suggest that all segments of the postal community sit down together and make recommendations to Mr. Waxman and myself as to how this problem can be solved. And that's going to take some compromise, and everybody's going to have to sit down together. The, the postal unions, uh, the postmasters, the, uh, mail, the, 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 the people who do a lot of mailing uh, through the mail, the, the, uh, the mass marketers, the uh, magazine publishers, all of you have to sit down, uh, the package delivers, and, and try to find out where you have some commonality so we can get a product that we can get through the Congress. If they make recommendations to Mr. Waxman myself, and myself how to solve this problem, then we think we can get it solved. This process will hopefully lead to a legislative proposal that can pass the House, the Senate, and be signed by the President. Compromise, as I said, is clearly necessary. Those who do not realize this and fail to participate in the process do so at their own peril. And the reason I say that is if you stay out of the mix and we come up with a solution to this problem, with which you do not agree and you've not participated in the process. And Mr. Waxman and I may draft a bill and may pass the House with both Senate and Democrat, with both Dem Democrat and Republican support, and pass the Senate and get to the President, 
and something that you feel is necessary in the bill may have been left out. So please appoint somebody from your area to work with other members of the community to come up with a proposal that you can present to Mr. Waxman and myself that we can work with. If we do that, I think we can come up with a product we can all be happy with and the American people will be satisfied with. And with that, Mr. Waxman, if you have an opening comment. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to uh, withhold my opening statement because Mr. Gilman has a meeting with That's President fine. Mubarak of Egypt and I want to allow him to go uh, first. Thank you. Peace in the Middle East is a, a, a very you. high priority. Peace in the Postal Service is a secondary priority. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Waxman, for yielding. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for conducting this hearing this morning. Along with Chairman Burton, as a longtime member of our former uh, Postal Committee and now, and now the inactive Postal Subcommittee, I'm pleased that our full committee is going to now devote time and attention to this important issue facing our U.S. Postal Service. It's important that we examine all of the factors leading up to the Postal Service current financial projections. We've all read the news reports and the memos that have met with our local postal supervisors, postmasters, labor leaders concerning the $3 billion of debt that the Postal Service now finds itself confronting. In fact, in my own congressional district in New York at the New City Post Office, I've been hearing of manpower shortages which already exist and now we're learning Postal Service may have to cut jobs even more so in order to help control costs. Accordingly, I'm left to wonder how the Postal Service will maintain the core mission of universal service. There are many reasons we can point at to answer just how the Postal Service has found itself in these troubled waters today. Continued decline in volume, insufficient revenues, electronic communication are just some of the problems confronting the Postal Service. However, these factors have all been foreshadowed by our colleague, Congressman John McHugh, over the past two Congresses, as he worked diligently to try to bring postal reform before the committee and before the Congress. We cannot now throw up our hands in dismay and wonder how the Postal Service has arrived at this point, when in fact we've known for some time that these factors do exist. The Postal Service must also be prepared to take responsibility for the difficult economic times they're now experiencing. Postal Service has known for some time the problems of inefficiencies in the postal system which do exist. Both the GAO and the Postal Service's IG has repeatedly testified before our Postal Subcommittee on the difficulties that the service has had in realizing opportunities on savings. Accordingly, Mr. Chairman, I'm hopeful that today's hearing will provide our committee with the consensus needed to move forward on postal reform, as well as to provide the Postal Service with the understanding that in order to survive and perform its core mission, changes in management practices are going to have to be made to implement and be adhered to. And I thank again uh, Mr. Waxman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Gilman, and uh, give Mr. Mubarak, President Mubarak, our regards. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to commend Mr. Gilman on his statement and wish him well in his meetings. Uh, I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing and putting this issue on the agenda with a, with a sense of priority, which you uh, have articulated so well, and I look forward to working with you because I think reforms in this area should be bipartisan. As a member of Congress, we all know too well the enormous undertaking uh, that, that postal employees do every day. In good weather and bad, postal workers haul and deliver our letters and packages, and we thank them for their efforts. But some serious challenges confront the Postal Service. Two months ago, the United States Postal Service Board of Governors reported the Postal Service will suffer a $2 billion to $3 billion deficit for fiscal year 2001. And since that announcement, the Board has called for an immediate freeze on capital commitments and is looking at reducing mail delivery service to five days and consolidating post offices. Some say the Postal Service is in the midst of a crisis. Well, I look forward to learning more about these problems from today's hearing and uh, the, the presentation of the witnesses that we have scheduled. I also look forward to learning more about these issues through the activities of the Postal Caucus, 
which is chaired by Representative Danny Davis. And I encourage all members of, on our committee to study these issues and join our postal caucus. I am committed to sensible postal legislation. Last year, with the support of many of my colleagues, I introduced H.R. 2535, the Postal Service Enhancement Act. It operated from the premise that the Postal Service performs a valuable service that should be strengthened and enhanced. The legislation provided rate-making flexibility, negotiated service agreements, and phased in postal rates. It also established a presidential commission to identify waste and inefficiency in the Postal Service and provided enhanced authorities for the Postal Rate Commission. Unfortunately, the measure was not considered by this committee. In the face of calls for postal legislation, we need to analyze the Postal Service's financial condition. We need to determine an accurate projection of postal revenues and losses and examine the procedures the Postal Service uses to track its actual costs and savings from productivity initiatives. We need to know the causes of postal deficits and identify structural or operational issues that could impact the service's ability to provide affordable universal postal service. We also need to make sure that the Postal Service is acting responsibly. For example, the freeze on construction of new facilities is dramatic action. We need to examine whether the freeze is justified by the facts. If it is simply an, an attempt to garner headlines and pressure Congress, the action will create ill will and be counterproductive. I know the chairman is interested in working on these important issues in a bipartisan fashion. I welcome his initiative and look forward to working with him and all of our colleagues on this committee to working on this uh, issue of how to uh, reform the Postal Service, deal with its uh, fiscal problems, and serve the needs of the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, we have about five minutes before we have to leave for the vote. Do any other members uh, at this time have uh, opening statements? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis, uh, well, uh, excuse me, <coughs> let me go to Mr. McHugh first, and then we'll go to the floor. Mr. McHugh, uh, we'll go to you, and then uh, we'll come back to Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll try to be brief. As everyone was uh, saying such nice things about me, I couldn't help but be reminded of a quote attributed to Mickey Mantle, one of my heroes, when he said, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Uh, if I would have known I was going to be so right, I probably would have worked harder. But uh, I, I do appreciate the kind things uh, that has been that have been said. And, and I'd like, Mr. Chairman, to uh, submit for the record my complete statement uh, that is available here for anyone who might be interested and just say a few words in, in summary, not the least of which is to uh, express my personal gratitude to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you were uh, kind enough to say I was the only person in the room who had the right to say I told you so. Uh, with all due respect, we disagree. I think there's a number of people in this room that starts with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, extends to good people who served on both sides of the aisle in the Postal Service uh, subcommittee including Mr. Davis, uh, Mr. Fatah and his ranking membership and others who, who did work hard and who recognized this problem and unfortunately I think are, are not too surprised by the developments that we've seen over the past uh, several months beyond those good people. Uh, I have to pay a particular tribute to uh, the Postmaster General Bill Henderson uh, who took incredible leadership and I suspect not uh, not a small amount of criticism from uh, amongst his peers for the uh, rather daring positions that he took. And I, I want to join with you, Mr. Chairman, in wishing him all the best in the future. He has certainly earned whatever good things may come to him, and although we'll miss him, uh, I know he'll be a great addition to whatever uh, effort he dedicates himself in, in, in the future. We do have some folks here with us today, too, that have been very, very supportive in the subcommittee's efforts over the past six years to identify these problems. The GAO, the Inspector General, the Congressional Research Service, uh, they have said to us repeatedly uh, that in fact uh, the Postal Service uh, is at the end of an era. Uh, that is uh, the words used by the GAO in 1999. And as I noted during our last uh, Postal Subcommittee hearing some seven months ago, 
Folks, we are fooling ourselves if we think that the growing pressure of declining revenues of increased costs on the base of the uh, Postal Service uh, does not require Congress, Congress to act and, and at long last to begin to address this uh, very, very serious uh, situation. We did have a base bill, a base bill that I'm pleased to say was reported unanimously twice with Republican and Democrat support from the subcommittee, but because of the reality of Washington that for far too many occasions uh, the urgent overcomes the merely important, um, it was not uh, able uh, to be advanced further. We now have a crisis. The time to delude ourselves to the contrary is past, and the statistics, the proposals that we've heard over the past several weeks, I think, underscore that. A two to three billion dollar operating deficit for this current fiscal year. Service will reach its, its uh, statutory debt limit of 15 billion dollars by October 1st of this year. Postal Service is running out of cash and has already caught, cut capital spending by some one billion dollars. 800 postal facilities due for construction or rehabilitation in every district and every community in this country put aside. The announcement yesterday, the Postal Service is seriously examining the possibility of terminating uh, Saturday deliveries. And this is only the beginning. I agree fully with the Chairman. Uh, the Postal Service has to draw upon uh, every option uh, as a first direction in trying to meet this challenge. Rate increases are something we'd like to see avoided at all possible cost. But at the end of the day, I would say to my colleagues, this is Congress's responsibility. When all of the efforts are made and whatever failures or successes might come, it is each member of the 435 member house that has to go home and tell his or her constituents why it is the Postal Service is not able to perform its core function because Congress failed to act. And I want to add my voice to those of the chairman, to Mr. Waxman, uh, to Mr. Davis, and others who stand ready to work on a bipartisan basis because this is not a matter of politics. It is a matter of policy. It is a matter of service to the people of this country. We owe it to them to work with in our abilities to at long last bring about meaningful postal reform uh, that meets all of the concerns of the incredibly diverse universe that is the Postal Service. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm looking forward to that effort. Thank you for your leadership, and uh, we're looking forward to the comments here today. Thank you for the, uh, your leadership, Mr. McHugh. Uh, we'll, we'll start with Mr. Uh, Davis when we come back. Uh, we'll stand in recess uh, for the vote to follow the gavel. Uh, the, the, the problem we have, uh, uh, Mr. Shays, is uh, members who are going to make opening statements uh, are going to have to go vote right now. No, so others are coming back, if you don't mind. Beg your pardon? We just continue. Others are coming on their way. Are they all coming back? All right. Well, then we'll turn the chair over to uh, Mr. Shays, and uh, we'll be is back in just a few moments. Is that all right with you, Henry? Davis was passed over. You did two on your side. Why don't you wait? Because he was going to go. We'll stand in recess to follow the gavel. Uh, please take their seats so we can resume. The chair now recognizes uh, the ranking member on the former post office and civil service subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to join with you today at the first full committee hearing devoted solely to the U.S. Postal Service. Although this is not a general post oversight hearing, it is timely given the recent developments in the financial status of the Postal Service, 
as a member of the former subcommittee on the Postal Service for a number of years, I can personally attest to the importance of the Postal Service, the service that it provides to the American people across this nation. Postal clerks, mail handlers, letter carriers, police inspectors, and others are engaged on a daily basis in the delivery, processing, and protection of our mail system. As a member of the former subcommittee, I can also speak firsthand to the efforts of Representative John McHugh and his staff to change the structure and operation of the Postal Service. His changes embodied in H.R. 22, the Postal Modernization Act, were unanimously voted from the subcommittee in April of 1999. This bipartisan action taken two years ago was an acknowledgment of the insight and the hard work of Representative McHugh. It also allowed us the opportunity to further define and refine postal legislation in a full committee setting. Unfortunately, while many in the postal community wanted change, agreement on just what that change should look like and how far it should go proved elusive. In July of 1999, Ranking Member Henry Waxman and Representative Chaka Fatah, former Ranking Member of the Postal Subcommittee, introduced legislation H.R. 2535, the Postal Enhancement Act. This, too, was in response to those wishing for change, although on a much narrower scope than the Postal Modernization Act. Since then and now, the Postal Service continues to push for change in the area of people, prices, and products. In addressing the people portion, the Board of Governors recently sent letters to the Hill pointing out that the 1970 Postal Reorganization Act establishes, and I quote, a system of collective bargaining followed by compulsory arbitration that mitigates against a negotiated settlement and which, moreover, has often placed some 80 percent of our total cost in the hands of a third-party arbitrator with neither understanding of nor the responsibility for our role and mission." Unquote. The Board has gone on to say that current postal law does not provide a mechanism to control wage rates relative to prices and products. The Board wants to adjust postage rates quickly and offer new products in response to market changes and needs. This hearing is timely because it allows us to pick up where we left off in the last Congress, with one exception. The Postal Service is now predicting a deficit of somewhere between two and three billion dollars, and a crisis is apparently at hand. To its credit, the Postal Service and Board have begun to take steps to stabilize the situation. Postal Service has warned us that their ability to deliver universal service is at risk without postal reform. The Board has called for an immediate freeze on capital commitments. The Postmaster General has just announced that it will cut $2.5 billion in cost, eliminate 75,000 jobs, and create a new mailing industry task force to assess the role and value of hard copy mail and identify opportunities for future growth. And of course, just yesterday, the Board directed management to study cost savings associated with reduction in the delivery of service to five days and consolidate postal facilities. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you, Ranking Member Henry Waxman and Representative McHugh and others as we seriously examine the Postal Service's financial status. And as the newly elected chair of the newly created bipartisan Congressional Postal Caucus, I invite all of my colleagues and urge them to join so that we will have many opportunities to engage in discussions relative to the current state of the Postal Service. I believe that this medium would be an excellent chance to really seriously understand as well as further hammer out possibilities as we deal with the realities of our situation. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Look forward to us seriously tackling this problem. I thank you very much and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Barr? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, echo the comments of uh, Mr. Davis, and thank you for uh, your leadership on this issue. I think uh, the 
the United States Postal Service is clearly important to us, so this ought to be a topic uh, for our full committee, and I appreciate, uh, as always, your taking the leadership on, on key issues. Uh, as have many uh, members of Congress, I've uh, lived and worked overseas, uh, and I know through having uh, suffered through postal services in other countries uh, how fortunate we are here in America to have the finest postal service anywhere in the world, and I honestly believe that. Uh, as probably most members do, I work very closely with our post offices in uh, our district. I work very closely with our postmasters, uh, as well as uh, the men and women uh, who perform the vital service of delivering our mail. Uh, that being said, Mr. Chairman, I'm very disturbed by the recent reports of financial difficulties uh, in the Postal Service, and I think it's very timely that we look uh, very, very carefully and very comp comprehensively at what has caused what appears to be a very, very sudden turnaround. Uh, and I'm also very concerned about reports that we continue to receive about uh, excessive bonuses, uh, excessive reimbursements uh, for relocating employees, limousines, uh, lavish parties. Uh, hopefully uh, all of those reports that we're getting, all of the discussions that we get uh, from uh, members of the Postal Service are all wrong uh, in those regards, and maybe we can clear the record on that uh, here today. Uh, if they are not completely made up, though, we do have some serious problems with how uh, monies are being spent. Uh, I also am extremely concerned about reports that are now surfacing that the United States Postal Service wants to cut out Saturday delivery. I think that would be the worst thing possible that they could do for themselves. There's nothing that would hasten people's uh, uh, interest in pursuing other forms of deliver delivering mail than that sort of cut off your nose to spite your face uh, activity or proposal by the Postal Service. Uh, here again, hopefully we'll uh, get this cleared up today uh, and the Postal Service leadership will tell us that those reports are completely inaccurate, that the Postal Service will be proud to continue to deliver mail to the American people and American businesses six days a week, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if those reports are not completely false and if we hear from the Postal Service today that they are indeed even contemplating that, uh, then uh, I think that uh, we will be in the situation of uh, dramatically or looking at dramatically changing the authority that the Postal Service has, uh, and I think that they will put themselves in a box that will result in uh, American businesses and citizens looking for alternative means of having their mail delivered. Uh, this would be one of the most self-defeating proposals that I have ever heard in my life, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think your hearing today could not be more timely. I uh, appreciate uh, the witnesses coming forward and look forward to uh, a very, very productive hearing, not only today, uh, but as you continue to exert leadership on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Mr. Kucinich, or was he, was, uh, who was here first? Why don't, we, why don't we go with Ms. Maloney? Yield to that lovely lady. Ms. Maloney. <laughs> well, I'd be delighted to yield to Mr. Kucinich since he has got the seniority over me. Please, ma'am. What a gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, be associated with the comments of many of my colleagues. I certainly uh, agree with uh, Congressman McHugh from the great state of New York and the chairman that this is a bipartisan issue. It is a policy issue, one that we should all care about and all work on. And I agree with Mr. Barr. We do have the best postal service in the world and one that should continue six days a week. I would uh, like to summarize my remarks and put my full uh, comments into the record, but I am very glad that this hearing is being held, and I want to really express the distress that I had earlier in, in a, future, a former year when the Postal Committee was abolished and really merged into the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, and this year when the Postal Subcommittee was being eliminated. Um, uh, certainly, uh, quality universal postal service is incredibly important to every American, and I was very distressed when the subcommittee was, uh, was eliminated. I'm glad that my colleague, uh, Mr. Davis, along with uh, uh, friends on the other side of the aisle, has formed a task force on postal uh, service, of which I am a member, and I applaud them for taking that leadership role. I, I think that uh, everyone in this room has got to be upset by the revenue estimates generated by the Postal Service in recent months. What makes the situation even more confusing is that the estimates generated by the USPS are so entirely different from their own projections as recently as last year. 
Now, we have been told that, uh, uh, you know, and, and I just want to say that one of the things that happened last year was the rate increase. Now, this rate increase was supposed to ensure that the USPS would not repeat last year's financial problems. But now, just a few months later, the Postal Service tells us that we're looking at a two to three billion dollar loss. And my main question today is really a management question. How in the world did this change so much and so quickly? Now, the post office has said that they would like more flexibility. They would like more flexibility and to run the post office more like a private business. But I've got to say, what business in this country would even dream of succeeding with such poor planning and projections? So I think that we really have to look at uh, the management. And, uh, and, and even with these unclear, uncertain financial projections, the U USPS has basically shouted uh, from the rooftops about their problem, the, 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 the situation that they face. The, you know, the sky is falling. We're in a terrible situation. And they're saying that the only thing that can save the post office is radical postal reform. Now, indeed, everyone needs to reform every year, and we need to reform the post office and all of our agencies to, for, for a 21st century operation. But uh, we cannot uh, forget that the post office was created to serve all Americans in a convenient and affordable manner, and we have to make sure that that continues. And we cannot uh, make radical policy decisions based on unclear projections. Just last month, the post office uh, and the post service stopped all work on all capital projects across the nation. And yesterday, in a move that I, I believe was time to raise the profile of this hearing, the post office announced that it was considering uh, eliminating a Saturday service and closing postal facilities. Now, believe me, uh, we are all concerned about the post office's financial situation, but we cannot even begin to identify solutions to these problems if we do not have a clear picture and view of where we're going, if we don't have a clear planning. I am very uh, pleased to see Mr. Walker here, the general accounting officer, and I know that he will speak about some of the reforms they believe the post office should pursue, including better tracking of costs, expenses, and capital assets. And I'm very eager to hear their views and gain a better perspective on how accurate USPS projections are and just what is needed to ensure their, their future financial stability. And I am also interested uh, to learn from the Postal Service why their projections have changed so dramatically and whether they've implemented some of the efficiencies they have previously claimed would save $700 million a year. So hopefully today's hearing will shed some light uh, on these and other issues surrounding the operation of the post office and help us guarantee that the Postal Service remains a modern and effective organization for the 21st century and beyond. Thank you very much for having this uh, hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Ms. Uh, Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, also and Ranking Member Waxman for holding this critical hearing on the uncertain financial future of the United States Postal Service. I do also associate myself with the comments of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. After five years of operating at a surplus and a comparably minor loss in fiscal year 2000, the Postal Service's announcement of a potential $2 billion to $3 billion deficit in fiscal year 2001 is quite disconcerting. Such a dismal financial projection and reports of yet another increase in postal rates has taken my constituents and, and me by surprise after only recently becoming accustomed to the recent one cent stamp increase. In fact, in, in January of this year, the Postal Service increased rates an average of 4.6 percent. While it was not the 6 percent increase the service sought, um, at the time it was believed to be sufficient. 
Today, I'm interested in learning what has caused the Postal Service to abruptly fall into such a state of disrepair that they would be projecting losses in the same calendar year that they raised rates. To the defense of the Postal Service, I, I understand how difficult it must be to operate like a self-supporting business as intended by Congress without the flexibility of price control and within the framework of an antiquated piece of legislation. However, the constraints of the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 are not new challenges for the Postal Service and therefore do not sufficiently explain such a dramatic reversal of financial fortune over this past fiscal year. In addition, this committee is well aware that increased competition from private delivery companies and electronic communication alternatives, such as the Internet, have led to substantial declines in the service's first-class mail volume. These challenges will only grow over the next decade as broadband Internet access is extended to each residence. I hope that our witnesses will be able to inform this committee as to what action has been taken to better compete during this ever-evolving information age and how successful these actions have been. For instance, what success has the Postal Service experienced with its e-commerce ventures, e-bill pay, an online bill paying service, and poster CS, an electronic document delivery service? Finally, I'm also concerned with some of the Postal Service's short and long-term strategies to address its financial frustrations. Today, the media reports that the Postal Service Board of Governors has directed management to study the cost savings associated with reducing delivery service to five days a week. I feel that this cost-cutting approach will compromise the Postal Service's commitment to universal service and its renowned reputation for customer service. Reducing the number of delivery days will have a devastating impact in our economy and should in no way be pursued as a viable option. Our reliable and affordable postal service is the hallmark of our nation's infrastructure. And for many neighborhoods, the post office plays a more active role in the fabric of the community than simply providing a facility for the uh, dissemination of mail. For instance, in my district, Garrett Park, uh, the postmaster, the postal workers, and the facility provide a healthy environment for local residents to meet, discuss issues of concern as they pick up their mail. Um, whatever actions uh, or whatever action is taken to resolve this financial crisis, I urge the Postal Service to preserve this, which has become the last remaining vestige of our great American cu uh, culture. And I look forward to a bipartisan resolution of this. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady, uh, Mr. Kostinich. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The new 34 cent stamp, uh, U.S. postal stamp, has a uh, depiction of the Statue of Liberty. And I think it's appropriate at this time in our deliberations about the Postal Service that we reflect on this stamp. Yes, it costs 34 cents, and yes, for that 34 cents, people have reliable service, service that's accountable. But more than that, this 34 cents and this stamp representing the Statue of Liberty speaks to the Postal Service in another way. And that is that the Postal Service is connected to a basic freedom that the people of this country have, an ability to communicate with one another that for 34 cents, you can send a message across the country. You don't have to own a computer. You can send a message to anywhere in the country. You could send a message from Cleveland, Ohio, where I live, to a small town in Alaska, where only a few hundred people live. You can enable people to communicate with each other all around this country and with the help of the Postal Service all over the world. So the U.S. Postal Service is really about freedom as much as it is about a service. And the United States Postal Service has for countless years provided universal service. 
we have to think, step back and think about the purpose of government here. Government certainly exists to provide a service. We hope that government doesn't lose money in doing that, but sometimes that happens. The Honorable Inspector General stood before one of our subcommittees recently and told us that the Department of Defense, which provides a service, cannot reconcile $2.3 trillion of accounting entries. We're talking about billions of dollars. We're talking about $2.3 trillion in accounting entries. Would anyone suggest that we go to mercenaries as opposed to a Department of Defense in order to uh, somehow have better service? No, we try to solve the problems that we have with the defense budget. In Social Security, there were projections that Social Security was going to have a shortfall. And the forces of privatization marched into Congress and said, well, now we must turn Social Security over to the stock market. Would anyone, would anyone suggest that today? Because everyone knew the truism that what goes up must come down. The market went down. People are saying prayers of thanksgiving that money was not invested in the stock market. Years ago, prior to the privatization of Medicare, we saw people getting service, the best service they could get through the help of the federal government, the Medicare program. But the privatization of Medicare through Medicare HMOs have resulted in service going down, costs going up. So let's look at our postal service, this universal service, this government service, this public service, which provides the same service for everyone, no matter what social or economic class, no matter whether they live in the city, the suburb, or rural areas, a service which is accountable to this Congress, that's why we have this hearing here today, a service where someone can call us if they're not satisfied with us, and a member of Congress can find out why not. We understand that there are individuals interested in privatization who look at the post office not as a service to be rendered to the American people, but as an opportunity for making profit. We understand that. This is a great country which provides everyone an opportunity to make money. That's one of the great things about America. But we're talking about a government service here. We're talking about a public responsibility that we have to make sure the American people can communicate to everyone. So as we move forward with these deliberations, let us not forget the excellent work that is being done by the men and women of the U.S. Postal Service. Let's be grateful for a service that we have had that's, been a that's enabled Americans to communicate with each other. And let's not forget the responsibility that we have to keep this service intact, to get it through its current financial difficulties and put it on the path where it can continue many more generations of serving the American people. I thank the chairman for holding this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Aging and an anachronistic infrastructures pose an, an ominous threat to our economic well-being. The president eloquently and passionately decries the human and physical costs of a public education system hobbled by low expectations and poor performance. Energy consumers are just beginning to pay the price demanded by long-neglected energy production and conservation system. Interstate com commerce is slower and more costly due to crumbling highway and railroad bridges. Today, we discuss the decay besetting another national economic pipeline, the United States Postal Service, the USPS. With increased competition from economic electronic mail, faxes, the internet, and unregulated shippers, both foreign and domestic, the USPS appears to have entered a death spiral. Cost controls and productivity increases remain limited and elusive. Required by law to raise rates to meet costs, each price increase drives more consumers away. It wasn't meant to be this way. The current statutory structure reformed a 1970s post office unquestionably dominated, dominant and financially capable of providing universal service. Never intended to operate as a competitive enterprise, the USPS we see today was designed to operate as a government service and entry-level employer. But the world has changed much in three decades. 
the laws governing postal operations, human capital management, and rate setting have not. As a result, today's postal service is a lumbering behemoth, a dinosaur forced to raise gazelles. I am concerned that we, as custodians of this national economic asset, seem unable, seem able only to tinker at the margins of the problem, while the need for fundamental structural reform of the postal delivery system goes unmet. I hope this hearing and those that will surely follow will move us toward a modern, efficient, and affordable postal system that will empower, not impede, national economic well-being. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Mr. Shikowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to welcome our distinguished witnesses here today to discuss the Postal Service's financial standing. And I look forward to their testimony. I would like to associate myself with Mr. Kucinich's remarks. And I, too, want to acknowledge the importance and the generally excellent work of the Postal Service. But that being said, news of financial problems at the Postal Service concern me and my constituents. Postal issues rate among the highest concerns of my constituents in the Chicago area. While there are over 1,200 postal employees working in the 9th Congressional District, I am repeatedly informed by some letter carriers that our postal workers have to work long and long hours and sometimes double and triple shifts. I hear that from, from constituents that letter carriers work routes which with, with with which they are not familiar as substitutes, leading to a less timely and accurate delivery of the mail. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I am aware that the Postal Service has put a halt to all capital commitments. This decision has put a stop to two projects in my district, one in Skokie and one in Edgebrook. In Illinois, there are a total of 25 projects scheduled for 2001 that are currently on hold. We all need to look very seriously at the reasons for halting these projects that could improve service to consumers and the various proposals for improving this system so that postal workers and postal customers are fairly treated and served. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I hope our GAO and Postal Service witnesses can address some of these issues for the committee today. Thank you, Ms. Schakowsky. Uh, Mr. Otter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to uh, shorten my remarks considerably so that we've got more time for questioning. I think there's going to be a lot more gain because of what the other members have already said uh, relative to uh, the Postal Service today. But, Mr. Chairman, a lack of accountability and oversight has given the United States Postal Service free reign to stray from its core mission of delivering the mail. The Postal Service has an unfair competitive advantage over the private sector because of its monopoly in revenues and in privileges. As a result, private competitors and taxpayers are economically disadvantaged and the mail users are forced to pay ever-increasing stamp prices. The Postal Service brings in $50 billion every year from its, from its monopoly on letter mail, yet it continues to seek sources, other sources of revenue. Recently, the Postal Service lost $85 million, it was reported, to try to create new market ventures for things such as phone cards, videos, TV, uh, T-shirts, baseball caps, stationery, greeting cards, ties, and also by selling advertising on its vehicles. The Postal Service has maintained a $300 to $500 million annual advertising budget despite the fact that it has no, comp no competition in the first-class monopoly. The Postal Service has used this advertising money to directly compete with companies who must necessarily operate in the private sector without all of the perks of a government agency like the Postal Service. The United States Postal Service productivity has increased only 11 percent over the last three decades, even with all the advantages that we have seen in technology. Time and again, the Postal Service has said it will work on reducing costs and increasing productivity. Taking a look at one item, twice the Postal Service has paid for studies that was done for an annual cost processing, the annual cost for processing undeliverable, undeliverable as addressed mail. It appears that the Postal Service has not significantly changed the way that it deals 
with undeliverable as, as address mail because it continues to lose $1.5 billion annually on that loss alone. From 1995 to 1999, the Postal Service has budgeted $8.5 billion on capital investment in automation and mechanization equipment. However, it only spent $5.2 billion. The Postal Service portrays the image that it is not concerned with productivity or enhancing their efficiency, and this is of great concern, yet they still want another postal rate increase. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, with the projections of this year's deficit at $2.3 billion, the Postal Service needs to refocus their mission on delivering the first class mail, stop using taxpayer money to compete with the private sector, and start making sound business decisions and ultimately needs a thorough review by this committee in Congress. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Before I go, any uh, opening statement, and we'll wait for questions. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The uh, gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Strzok, is recognized if he has an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really do not have an opening statement except to say that uh, I agree with almost everything I've heard from my colleagues here, and at the appropriate time and after we've heard for our, from our witnesses, I, too, have about five or six questions I'd like to ask. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I'm glad that uh, we're holding this hearing on the uh, Postal Service's uh, current financial position and the impact postal loss projections will have on the ability of the agency to fulfill its statutory mission under the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970. But before I go on, I would just want to thank all the men and women of the Postal Service who deliver the mail six days a week and do a very good job in my district and I'm sure across the nation. We all want a strong and stable Postal Service. The Postal Service processes about 208 billion pieces of mail a year, or about 680 million pieces of mail every day. Additionally, the Postal Service delivers mail to over 5,600 new addresses every day. It gener generates $65 billion in operating revenues and operates 38,000 post offices, stations, and branches. For several years, postal reform has been a big issue before this committee in Congress. In the 106th Congress, Congressman McHugh uh, introduced H.R. 22, the Postal Modernization Act, and Congressman Waxman introduced H.R. 2535, the Postal Enhancement Act. The Subcommittee on the Postal Service held he hearings on, on both of these uh, reform items. There's widespread agreement that reform is needed for the Postal Service. This committee has the oversight responsibility to explore exactly what type of reform is needed. The Postal Service must develop a long-range uh, strategic plan that truly assesses postal reform. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses, uh, David and Walker, uh, William J. Henderson, and uh, S. David Feynman. I hope they will be able to help us examine, examine postal losses and revenues, postal rate increases, deficit and mail volume projections, competition, information technology, and budget forecasting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know we need to get near the uh, excellent witnesses, but I just want to mention a few things. One is, I don't think any of us have a problem with the letter carriers and clerks we know. I've spent 30 years in Long Beach. I've never had a problem with anybody behind the counter or anybody walking the mail. And that started when I was a little kid on a farm and the, Mr. Cagney, the rural carrier, uh, was the, uh, not only a newspaper for the rest of the county, but also sent our mail around the world. But uh, what I do have a problem with is some of the supervisors uh, and some of the central operation here in Washington. Uh, let me give you an example. I spent a, talking to a 100 federal injured workers one afternoon. 60 of them came out of the Postal Service. One of them 
had after the truck had fallen on his foot or something he asked for the form to file under the federal workers compensation law the postal server supervisor wouldn't give him that why because that supervisor his performance is that you don't have these things happening and apparently that's the way the system works well i think it's a lousy way to work when it does that they when the supervisors start helping people and the central postal administration here starts thinking about people we're never going to get anywhere with the postal service and i guess when i heard that postmaster general runyon had a hundred thousand dollars spent on his farewell dinner and all i must say i get a little upset as one that cares about the taxpayers money to say the least and any agency's money we finally got a post office person in long beach that started things moving named mr shapiro he'll probably be punished now that i've said that and after all gee you know somebody in the line is helping people what do you know uh, the fact is that uh, the city of Long Beach, uh, half a million people, surrounds the city of Signal Hill, 10,000 people. We want a zip code for them. Why? Because all their insurance rates go up when they use the zip codes coming from the inner city of Long Beach, California. And I think that is just outrageous not to get a decent zip code for the city. Now, they can make laughter down there and all the rest of it, but uh, I would say that their post office, when it starts acting like a humane institution, I'll have more respect for it. But right now, with the management of the postal de uh, department, uh, I'm not happy about it. And I want them to know about it and get off their seats and start to getting something done. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Uh, Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just a few remarks. Um, I hope we're not at another low point for the post office. We encountered such a point in the early 90s when, I, uh, when there was a great deal of oversight by this committee. Uh, we may recall that mail delivery times around the country uh, were uh, terrible none worse than here in Washington, D.C., where official mail as well as residential mail was, was uh, delivered uh, at, <clears throat> at times that were among the worst in the country. Uh, to their credit, the post office improved uh, extraordinarily in delivery mail times. I'm not sure what it is today, but I, there was cosmic improvement uh, after some oversight here and management focused on the problem. That leads me to believe that if management focuses on the problems that have arisen today, they too can be solved. I don't agree with my friends on the other side that the post office can still deliver mail at low rates and not become more market oriented. Certainly they're going to have to compete with the private sector if they're going to keep the cost of mail down for the average person that must depend on the mail. That unlike members of Congress, do not, except for the franc, which is paid for, do not, do not communicate by fax or email or any of the other gadgets. We can't have it both ways. In fact, the, the post office was criticized we're not becoming more competitive. Well, they, they've gone and done some of that, and I'm not sure they've done enough of it. I'm not worried about the private sector, because we have extraordinary privatized, uh, privatized uh, services, and of course, they don't have the same burden of keeping the cost of the average letter down the way we insist, justifiably so, that, that the Postal Service do. I do want to raise one concern that I have there is a pejorative uh, term that has come into our language, going postal. This comes from the fact that there have been a fair number of 
violent incidents involving postal workers uh, and the question has been raised over and over again about the stress that is associated with mechanization of the and automation of services and perhaps with improved management that forces workers uh, into patterns uh, that are more rigid than before. Uh, I, I am very concerned with how labor relations uh, are in fact handled in a, 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 with the increasing pressure on the, on the post office to deliver mail at lower cost and compete with the private sector. Uh, I went out with a postal worker here in the District of Columbia, asked the, uh, asked the post office to just give me a worker to go with at random. And I was astounded by what I saw. Uh, he was often the only person that residents saw. He, he had an, an extraordinary relationship with his neighborhood. He climbed, uh, I went, it was, in, it was in Adams Morgan, he climbed steps uh, over and over again. He must have been in, in the best shape. Uh, I want to learn more today about how management is coping with its cost problems, and I want to learn more today about how management is coping with its labor management problems. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Mr. Walker, uh, I think uh, we're ready now to uh, have you sworn. Would you stand? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so for God? Thank you. I, and, uh, I assume you have an opening statement? Okay. Can you I do, Mr. Chairman, and as you have okay. already noted, uh, the entire statement I know will be in the record, so if I can summarize it now, I would appreciate it. I'm pleased to be here today to participate in this, committee here, this committee's hearing on the U.S. Postal Service. The Postal Service plays a vital role in our economy. It links people together and helps to bridge the growing digital divide. Overall, the service, however, faces major challenges that collectively call for a structural transformation in order for it to remain viable in the 21st century. The last major reform of the Postal Service occurred in 1970. The world has changed fundamentally since 1970. It will change even more in the coming 31 years. The service's projected financial losses have increased significantly during the past four months. Over the past two years, we've raised concerns about a range of financial, operational, and human capital challenges that threaten the Postal Service's ability to continue to provide affordable, high quality, and universal postal service on a self-financing basis. Moreover, the service's financial outlook has worsened more quickly than expected, and it is not clear how the service will address its mounting financial difficulties and other challenges. These challenges include, as chart one will show, uh, which is also slide one in your packet. The service's net income has declined over the past five years, and the service currently projects a fiscal 2001 deficit of between $2 billion and $3 billion, up from a projected loss of $480 million just four months ago. It's my understanding that the two primary reasons for the change in the projection was, number one, uh, a postal rate increase that was $800 million lower than they expected to get, and number two, a decline in the economy and the, the, the effect, resulting effect on volume. Uh, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, uh, as the Social Security and Medicare trustees do, and I was a trustee of Social Security and Medicare for five years, in general, I think it's not a good idea to project rate increases unless you know for a fact that they're going to occur. Uh, uh, and so, therefore, I think one of the reasons for the variance is because there was a projected rate increase that, in fact, had not been approved, and that's $800 million. That's a lot of money. Further, in fiscal 2002, the Postal Service estimates that its deficit will be in the $2.5 to $3.5 billion range, assuming no further rate increases. If I could refer you now to chart two, costs have been growing at a faster rate than revenues over recent years. And now to chart three, which is figure five, uh, I believe. 
The service has experienced a net increase in outstanding debt at the end of each fiscal year since 1997, and its total outstanding debt reached $9.3 billion at the end of fiscal 2000. Service officials expect that they could reach the $15 billion statutory debt limit by the end of fiscal 2002, assuming no additional increases in postal rates. In addition, the service does not have a plan to reduce its debt burden. Depending on future events, the service may face a cash shortage in years fiscal 2002 or 2003. The, the next chart, if you can, which would be slide number six, I believe. The service faces increasing competition from both domestic and foreign-based entities. It also expects that certain electronic diversion of existing mail will be caused by greater use of the Internet that will cause a substantial decline in first-class mail volume in the next decade and thus place the service under, in its own words, extreme financial pressure. Although the service has taken steps to cut its cost by $2.5 billion by two, 2003, or it, it plans to do so, uh, through increasing productivity and improving human capital programs, it has historically had great difficulty in achieving its planned outcomes. The service has also had periodic conflicts with some of its key stakeholders, including the postal unions and the Postal Rate Commission. We have noted long-standing labor management relations problems that have hindered improvement efforts, including the fact that three major labor agreements expired in November 2002, which collectively cover over a half a million of the Postal Service's workforce. In addition, the Postal Service and the Postal Rate Commission have had long-standing disagreements concerning pricing decisions, and they continue. The service is subject to several statutory and other restrictions that serve to limit its ability to transform itself. Uh, a lot of these provisions were put in place in the last reform in the 1970s, and some pre-exist that. Finally, two key leadership positions need to be filled relating to critical postal operations and rate setting, namely the Postmaster General. Postmaster General Henderson has announced that he will be leaving next month. In addition, the chairman of the Postal Rate Commission, uh, uh, former Chairman Ed Gleiman, is no longer chairman. He resigned, and both of those positions, critical leadership positions, are vacant at the present point in time. Based upon all this information, Mr. Chairman, we believe that the service's deteriorating financial situation and the contributing structural challenges calls for prompt, aggressive action, particularly in the area of cutting costs and improving productivity, including considering existing legislative provisions that serve to limit the ability of the Postal Service to transform itself. Accordingly, we are adding the Postal Service's transformation efforts to our high-risk list effective immediately so that we and others can focus on its financial, operational, and human capital challenges before the situation reaches truly crisis proportions, where the options for action may be more limited. Let me emphasize, we are not putting the entire Postal Service on our high-risk list. Management and employees at the Postal Service do some things right. And in fact, on-time delivery has improved significantly over the last several years. Rather, we are focusing on the challenges associated with the transformation effort and the related obstacles that must be addressed in order to enable the Postal Service to truly transform itself for the 21st century. In our view, we believe that the following actions need to be taken. First, the Postal Service should develop a comprehensive plan in conjunction with Congress and its other key stakeholders, such as the postal unions and management associations, customers, the Postal Rate Commission, uh, that would identify the administrative and legislative actions needed to address the service's financial, operational, and human capital challenges, and that would establish a time frame and specify key milestones for achieving desired results. Secondly, the service should provide summary financial reports to the Congress and the public on a quarterly basis. These reports should present sufficiently detailed in information for the stakeholders to understand 
the service's current and future projected financial condition and how its outlook may have changed since the previous quarter and its progress towards achieving the desired results specified in its comprehensive plan. And last but certainly not least, GAO will work with the Congress and the service to identify and analyze possible improvement options and will continue to analyze and report to the Congress on the service's ongoing financial condition. In consultation with other postal stakeholders, including the Postal Service Office of the Inspector General, Postal Unions and Management Associations, the Postal Rate Commission, and customers, GAO will review the service's financial results and future outlook, progress on cost-cutting and productivity efforts, other countries' experiences in dealing with related challenges, and the options for addressing the service's short-term and long-range challenges. Mr. Chairman, uh, that concludes my prepared remarks, and I would be more than happy to answer any question that you or any other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, General Walker. Uh, you reported uh, just a moment ago that uh, the Postal Service is being added to the GAO's high-risk list. Uh, I have a couple of questions on that. Maybe I'll just give them all to you at once, and you can add, uh, add answer them collectively. Uh, what factors do you take into consideration when determining an agency or program should be placed on the high-risk list? That's number one. Uh, is it unusual for an agency or a program to be added to the high-risk list during a congressional session? I mean, immediately. I mean, this we didn't know about this until just recently, and boom, all of a sudden it hit us. And third, uh, what would it take for the Postal Service to be removed from the high-risk list? If you can start off with that question, I'd appreciate it. I'll be happy to, Mr. Chairman. They're all excellent questions. First, what are the factors that we consider? We, last year, in calendar 2000, we published for notice and comment the factors that we use in determining when a function or program is deemed to be high risk and number two, what it takes to get off. Some of the factors that are relevant uh, for considering when somebody goes on is, is the program of national significance. I think we can all agree that the Postal Service has a program that is of national significance. Uh, it, does the challenge relate to a key management function uh, that deals with its performance and accountability? Does the risk relate to a systemic or structural problem? Does it involve $1 billion or more of taxpayer funds? Have there been adequate corrective measures identified? And uh, what is the progress towards addressing those? Based upon applying these criteria uh, in our professional and independent judgment, we believe that the Postal Service's transformation effort meets this criteria. In other words, that transformation effort is at high risk, not the entire Postal Service. There are several significant subsequent events that have occurred since we made our determination about the January 2001 list. We made that determination in early November in order to finalize it and to publish it. The significant subsequent events, for example, have been a significant deterioration in the projected financial condition of the Postal Service escalating from an approximate $470 million anticipated loss for this year to 2 to $3 billion and further escalating in the future. Secondly, mounting debt without a debt repayment plan. Thirdly, a continued conflict over rate setting. Uh, fourthly, key leadership voids. The, the, uh, the Postmaster General announced that he was going to not, not seek reappointment and the chairman of the Postal Rate Commission uh, resigned during this period of time. Uh, in addition, three major labor agreements expired and are now set for binding arbitration, covering over half of the Postal Service's workforce. And finally, last but certainly not least, the board itself has asserted that it is at serious risk of not being able to achieve its statutory mission. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we could have waited on the two-year cycle but I think if the facts, if there have been significant subsequent events and the facts dictate that it meets our high-risk criteria, and if it's an important enough program, and I would argue the Postal Service transformation effort uh, is important and the Postal Service clearly is, then I think we have a responsibility to act. Those are the times that we're in. We can't necessarily wait two years before we end up adding critical areas to the high-risk list. Uh, as far as what it will take to get off, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, sure. which I think was your third question, we, there must be a plan 
a specifically identified plan dealing with both operational as well as legislative challenges to try to address these issues there must be commitment on behalf of the parties to do it it must be implemented and we must see some meaningful results and we must be convinced that it's on a sustainable path to deal with uh, some of the major structural problems in order to get it off the list i might add that there is an analogous situation it may not sound analogous but i think there is an analogous situation that occurred earlier in the one nine hundred ninety s i used to be a head of the pension benefit guarantee corporation uh, that that corporation is a government corporation that is intended to be self financing uh, that is uh, that was experiencing deteriorating financial condition and had certain operational problems as well as certain legislative challenges uh, gao put it on its high risk list in the, uh, the that program that insurance program the single insurance program in the early nineteen nineties and through a combination of management actions and legislative action it was removed from the list several years later i think it, uh, it it's a decent analogy even though they're in a totally different line of business yeah. let, let me ask real, quick, real quickly one more question i think you alluded to the fact that the Postal Service will reach the, reach the statutory borrowing limit of $15 billion sometime in the next uh, year or two. Uh, what, what will that mean for postal operations when they reach that limit, and uh, will the Postal Service run out of cash? Well, obviously, uh, it will then depend upon what the projected cash flows are. Right now, they're using this borrowing authority for two things, for modernization, for construction activities, as well as to cover operating losses, mm -hmm. any, any cash flow problems from operations. By law, as you know, they can only borrow two, two billion a year for construction and, and improvements, and only a billion a year to cover uh, the negative cash flows associated with operations. Uh, I think it'd be better to ask them what they project their cash flows to be uh, in 2003, uh, but they are deteriorating uh, and we expect right now if they don't get a postal rate increase that they could hit the debt limit in 2002 by the way the answer is not simply to raise rates uh, it's a more fundamental structural issue that we need to look at here because you could simply raise rates and deal with the short-term problem but that's dealing with a symptom rather than dealing with the disease and we need to deal with the disease i think uh, mr davis Chairman, um, Mr. Walker, you, you, you indicated that if the service is, is to reach a break-even point, in all probability, <coughs> that's going to occur through a rate increase, although you've indicated that you would suggest or hope that that would be the last thing that could happen or that every effort should be made to minimize, I mean, that occurrence. You also indicated that one of the ways of generating new revenue or additional revenue is through services and products, but we note that the Postal Service has had a difficult time generating real money with, 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 with services and products. Given those facts, do you see any way other than perhaps through a rate increase that uh, the situation can be reversed? I think we need to look at a range of options. I think we need to look at uh, opportunities for cutting costs, for enhancing productivity. I think we also need to look for uh, that the Congress needs to consider uh, looking both on the, the, the rate setting side as well as some of the restrictions that are imposed on the Postal Service with regard to uh, automatically going to binding arbitration, uh, some of the issues that affect its cost structure, uh, as to what you can do to provide reasonable flexibility uh, to the Postal Service to allow itself to try to transform itself, working with its stakeholders, while providing appropriate accountability for results. I think there are opportunities for uh, for economies, uh, for cost cutting, for productivity improvement, uh, but uh, at the same point in time, uh, I think there are some structural impediments that they have, uh, you know, th that are going to have to be addressed in order to try to enable them to pursue certain things. You are right, also, Mr. Davis, that historically, at least based on our experience, 
uh, most, many of the efforts that the Postal Service has made to try to get into different products and services have not resulted in additional margin. Uh, they, have, they, have, they have not resulted in helping the situation, and some situation have, have hurt. We know that in almost any business situation, when we start talking about how to come out of a dilemma, immediately we think of cutting costs, that is, reducing the, the requirements for operating. Do you think that we, we can cut costs and at the same time continue to provide the high quality of service that we've heard some members allude to that, that they've been able to receive and benefit from? Well, clearly the, the Postal Service, I think, is, has done a good job and has improved its on-time delivery uh, over, over the past several years. And customer service in general uh, has uh, the, the, uh, the customer satisfaction rates have generally been positive and have generally been moving in the right direction, if you will. Uh, and so I think what we want to do is we want to try to minimize postal rate increases uh, and, and maintain quality and reliability of the service. I do think, however, that we need to look at more market-oriented uh, approaches to things like re rate setting, considering price elasticity a lot more than has been the case. In other words, obviously to the extent that you end up raising rates on certain types of, uh, of postal uh, postage, uh, it's likely to have in some cases, it could have a very serious adverse effect on the volume. In other cases, it won't have a ser serious adverse effect on the volume. On the other hand, if you look on the cost side, I think we also have to look at how, what benchmark is being used to set labor wage rates. Uh, what's the benchmark that's being used to determine that those rates are fair? Uh, to what extent is it based on skills, knowledge, and performance? Uh, to, to what extent is it not based on those factors? Uh, I think we also have to look at things compared to other countries and other systems because everything in the world is relative. We have to learn from them. What are some of the things that they did in order to try to minimize costs while maintaining reliable service? And we're doing some work in that area, and I think it can help this committee tremendously in trying to deal with some of these issues. And finally, if, if I could, why do you think the service has had um, not as much success as, as desirable in generating large amounts of revenue with its new products or, or services? Uh, I don't know how much market testing there has been. You may want to ask the Postmaster General that question, but it's not clear to me that there's been a significant amount of uh, concept testing, market testing uh, in advance of some of these products and services that normally you would see in the private sector um, th that would occur. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm just wondering if sometimes we're not really whistling in the wind in terms of reaching for what's not there okay. when we try and come up with other approaches and other ways. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shays? Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue until we get to the five-minute mark, then we'll uh, recess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walker, thank you for being here. And uh, again, I appreciate the work and the effort that GAO has provided on this uh, very important issue, certainly over the past six years that I've been working on it, and, and that effort continues today. Let me ask you a general question with respect to all of these dire predictions. Uh, I've read your testimony and I understand that <clears throat> you're currently analyzing them in an in-depth fashion, but have you seen anything in your, your studies thus far that would suggest to you that uh, the two to three billion dollar estimate the Postal Service is currently projecting is uh, any way unreasonable or, or likely far too high? We're still analyzing their projection and, and I can't express I can't draw a conclusion at this point in time, but uh, uh, we haven't come any, nothing has come to our attention that I'm aware of that would cause us to say that it's unreasonable. So that's it, also based upon no increase in postal rates as well. Right. The biggest uncertainty associated with that projection is the Postal Service does not know, and frankly, nobody in America knows, uh, how soft the economy is going to, to get and how long it's going to last. 
Uh, and so that's probably the biggest, the biggest uncertainty that exists. I appreciate that. Uh, obviously, you've said here many times that uh, certainly one of the major challenges of many and one of the more frustrating things about this problem is it is so multifaceted. Uh, some of my colleagues like to talk about productivity. Others like to talk about uh, confining their, their unnecessary, in their view, competition, et cetera, et cetera. But, but clearly, one of the major problems is the fact that the structure, as you call it, the need for structural reform, is one that uh, has been in place for 30 years. Uh, would you agree with that? That's correct. I mean, the world is fundamentally different uh, yeah. today than it was 30 years ago. The, the type of competition that the Postal Service is facing is very different. There are several foreign countries who have their postal services with offices on our soil. They're starting out at first at trying to be able to get some of the international bulk market. There's nothing to preclude them from trying to be able to cherry pick some of the domestic market. Uh, through contracting type activities, et cetera. I think we have to keep that in mind. Uh, it's just a whole new ball game. The other thing is, is on the productivity front, uh, there's been, it's my understanding through speaking with my very capable staff, that there's only been about 11 percent productivity increase since the early 1970s uh, in the Postal Service. Now, to their credit, last year I think they had about a 2.4, 2.5 percent increase, uh, which is maybe the best year ever or clearly one of the better years. But the ability to sustain post, uh, productivity increases over time uh, has not been the case in the past, and, and uh, obviously that's something we, we hope can happen in the future yeah. to keep down uh, pricing. I, I believe it's the largest since 1993, and I think that's a tribute to uh, the uh, current Postmaster General. A little difficult to get too terribly produ productive on a $60 billion a year industry when 80 percent, 75 percent of your costs are, are driven by the employee. Uh, you do have a very aggressive automation uh, effort uh, underway. Uh, uh, Mr. Otter mentioned some shortfall figures. They did spend over $5 billion. Uh, I think most of us agree that's a lot of money even on Capitol Hill. Uh, but when the core of your service is to uh, walk that individual to every household in America, uh, unless you give them rollerblades, uh, productivity is a little hard to achieve, I, I would think. Uh, let me just finish up with a couple of comments. Uh, I think, my colleagues, we've got to remember when we get caught up, and I'm a Republican and I'm proud of that fact, uh, of the phrase competing against the private sector, we should always pause and ask ourselves who is competing against whom. Uh, I think our constituents, when they go to the Postal Service, want to be able to buy certain products and certain services like envelopes and boxes and want to be able to mail a box to the Postal Service, uh, and most of us would expect them to do that. Uh, there are a number of great delivery companies in the private sector uh, that I think uh, we've got to be cognizant of and sensitive to their positions as well. But the fact of the matter is uh, we've allowed the Postal Service one door to, to exit their current conundrum now 10 minutes, to exit their current conundrum, uh, and, and then we sit around and criticize them for walking out the door. Coffee cups, novelty t-shirts, probably not the best idea. I think it was a, a show of desperation by the Postal Service to try to gen generate revenues. Uh, thankfully, they've ended that. Uh, we do have to level the playing field. Uh, we required in our bill taxes on their competitive products, uh, gave increased oversight to the PRC, subpoena power. Uh, required them uh, to operate under antitrust provisions for those who are deeply concerned about FedEx, USPS, uh, recent partnerships and such. But at the end of the day, the reality is they're operating in a 30-year-old paradigm that doesn't work anymore. And it doesn't work for either the Postal Service, those folks who depend upon them, or those folks who choose very effectively to compete against them. When you've got a Postal Service that can't even under law put itself up for winning the federal government contract for overnight urgent mail, I think that suggests we've got to do some things that will allow them to operate differently and require them to operate differently, and I hope we can come to that agreement. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. McCune. We're going to rely uh, on your research and previous commitment as uh, subcommittee chairman uh, on this uh, legislation we're going to be working on. You're too good Mr. to be, Mr. Chairman. Cummins? 
Hey, we're now at about eight minutes. Do you mind? If no, if you like, we'll be glad to I, recess and I, you can speak when we come back. I really appreciate okay. that. We'll stand in recess. We have two votes on the floor. I apologize. This is one of the problems we have to deal with in the legislative process. Stand in recess to follow the gavel. We'll be back in about 20, 25 minutes. Please shut that door back there, and we'll go ahead and start. Uh, we're waiting on Mr. Cummins to come back. He's uh, next right in here. line for questions. Oh, no. Uh, I was Mr. here. Cummins, you yeah. did ask questions. I was here before Danny you. Davis was talking about, I guess. Oh, okay. I think Danny Davis. I'm sorry. Uh, General Walker, uh, over the years, the General Accounting Office has uh, done considerable work on the Postal Services finances and its delivery uh, performance. Uh, to what extent, maybe you've answered this somewhat, to what extent uh, will the Postal Service's current financial situation impact the delivery of the mail? Or do you have an answer to that? I mean, I think I should address there, there, that. There does not appear to be an immediate threat in any way to the, to the Postal Service's ability to continue to deliver the mail. Uh, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is that while it's losing money, it's lost money before, it still has borrowing authority but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we project, at least based on the information we've been given so far from the Postal Service, that it will become, uh, uh, they will, that the financial situation will become particularly critical at the end of 2002. What we think is important is to recognize that we need to deal with the structural problem here. Yes, we need to improve productivity. Yes, we need to cut costs. Yes, we need to try to minimize rate increases, but in order to try to accomplish all of those objectives, it's not only certain management actions are going to have to be taken, certain legislative reforms are probably okay. going to be necessary as well. Let, let, let me ask you this question, yes. uh, and then uh, I think, Mr. Cummings, you were next, so I, would, I, I apologize, I'll yield to you. Uh, 75 to 80 percent of the total costs of the Postal Service is personnel. Uh, we have tried over the years uh, to encourage automation, and I think they've taken steps to use new technologies and automation to speed up, speed up delivery service. Uh, it seems that uh, with the new technologies that we have, there could be more use of automation and technology without disrupting the personnel that works for the Postal Service. It seems to me, and maybe you can, maybe you've done some research on this, that through attrition, through people retiring, through people leaving the Postal Service, I don't know what the figures are per year. If you can't give me that, maybe the Postal Service can. But let's say out of the 900,000 employees, there's uh, 60,000 that uh, leave in a year, maybe even more than that. It seems that there could be an incremental change from heavy use of personnel for certain delivery processes to a heavier reliance on automation and, and without firing people or laying people off just through uh, attrition and retirements and, and a transfer to automation, we, <clears throat> we could make the kind of economies that we've seen in the auto industry. In the auto industry, I think they did it with layoffs, and, and I'm not saying that we should do that because I think we've got great people in the, in the Postal Service and through attrition you could do that. But they went to robotics instead of having people putting screws and bolts in an assembly line. Uh, why can't uh, that be done uh, uh, in an orderly fashion and, and reduce uh, costs? And if, if it can be done, why isn't it being done? Well, clearly, technology is part of the issue. I mean, in, in additional use of technology. And it's my understanding the Postal Service has ended up d doing more in the area of technology with regard to first-class mail to try to automate uh, more of that type of activity. Uh, but you properly point out that 
it, it costs money in order to be able to design and implement the new technology. And ultimately, if you're going to achieve the productivity increase and reduce overall cost, it's got to come from someplace. You properly point out, Mr. Chairman, 75 to 80 percent of the cost of the Postal Service deals with people costs. And therefore, ultimately, you're going to have to get that cost down. What needs to happen is an integrated plan that focuses on desired outcomes, that focuses technology investments along with strategic workforce planning so you, to the, as much as possible, you can do what you just said. Based upon attrition, you can end up hopefully being able to save money through attrition, use technology to, to do increased productivity. Uh, I don't know that that, ex that plan exists, quite frankly, Mr. Chairman. That's something you ought to ask uh, the we'll Service. address that to the Postal uh, people and the Postmaster General when we get a chance. Mr. Cummins? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Controller General, I just uh, want to thank you for your testimony. It, it's been very enlightening, to say the least. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, as I listen to you, you made a, um, a number of comments which led me to believe, you know, I, I kept saying, you know, is this, is this operation run like a corporation? Is it, because it seems to me if it were truly run like a corporation, either it would be out of business or be ma it would be doing pretty good. In other words, you talked about a number of the issues and it seems as if, if there were certain uh, key folks in certain positions that had certain responsibilities um, you wouldn't have things such as the, uh, these efforts to, uh, these non-traditional efforts to raise money, things of that nature. In other words, it just seems to me that you, you would have methods by which you could control and control, uh, what you're doing and at the same time, um, change as, society changes and its technology changes and it seems like something's out of kilter there the, the the postal service has a lot more restrictions placed on it both on the rate setting side or the revenue side and on the labor side than would exist in the private sector uh, for example if you take on the, uh, the the rate side there are a number of factors that the postal rate commission can consider and in fact that they do consider in setting rates. Uh, but a lot of it is, is, is driven by cost and the desire to minimize uh, overall rates, which we all can, we, we can agree to. Uh, in the private sector, I, I think you would, I know, that you would see a lot more consideration of uh, in, in determining how you, what you're gonna end up charging for particular classes of mail. You'd see a lot more consideration on what the likely rate increase would have on volume, that elasticity issue. And to, you would try to minimize overall rate increases, but what you'd also see is you'd see a circumstance that where the rate increases would be geared more towards areas where there's less competition and where it's less likely to, to have an adverse effect on volume, which obviously could, could cut revenues. On the labor side, Clearly, collective bargaining is very important. We want to support collective bargaining. You want to have cooperative labor management relations. That hasn't always been the case uh, at, at the Postal Service and in other entities as well. Uh, but you, you generally don't find circumstances in the, in the private sector where statutorily you, you're required to go to binding arbitration mm -hmm. uh, and where that is the outcome if the parties re reach an impasse. Uh, even take the FAA, take air traffic controllers. That, you know, that obviously is a vital function uh, for, for the public. Just as postal workers provide a vital function for this country for the reasons that are articulated. But the FAA, air traffic controllers, don't have binding arbitration uh, I I if they reach an impasse. Now part of the problem is, is that if you're not gonna do that, if you go through mediation, where is it gonna go? In the case of the FAA, comes to the Congress comes to the Congress, and that's problematic too. Uh, so I think what we need to do, Mr. Cummings, is, we, is, is there needs to be a plan that recognizes we, we've got to try to minimize cost, we've got to try to in, increase productivity, we've got, to, we've got to try to minimize rate increases, uh, and there are things that can and should be done administratively within the context of current law, but I also think that we have to look at what type of reforms might be necessary given the passage of 31 years in a fundamentally different economy 
to try to look at some of the framework uh, and see if that framework might have to be modified in light of changes in the economy and in light of increasing competition. Just one, just one other question. Let's assume you had maximum cooperation from the Congress and you were able to do the things that you think you need to get done to do to accomplish what you want to accomplish here. Um, what kind of timetable are you ter talking about in, in turning it around so that you are operating in the black? Well, first, uh, I'm not not you, but yeah, I mean the that's the Postal Service, right? Yes. What we propose, Mr. Cummings, is you, you've been such an expert. I mean, I almost you know, <laughs> sound like you need to be in the Postal Service. I've already got a good job, Mr. Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. I thought maybe you were I, me I, I thought maybe you're looking for a night job. <laughs> I, I got a night job already, too. But last week, Mr. Horn tried to make me chief operating officer of the U.S. government. I told him I had a good day job and, and a night job on my end. But in any event, but I, I do believe, as we say in our testimony, that it's incumbent upon the board and it's incumbent upon management to come forth with a proposal. But I think that we need to, uh, I, I think we need to have a clean sheet of paper here. I, I don't think that we can necessarily assume that the, that, that, uh, that the past problems uh, or obstacles have existed, whether, uh, you know, including relevant political considerations. I think we've got to at least put that stuff on the table. I think we've got to talk about it uh, because ultimately we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to make this situation more relevant for the 21st century, and, and we're not going to be able to get around that. It's just a matter of when we're going to come to that realization where we're going to act on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummins. Mr. Clay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd like to also request uh, unanimous consent to submit my opening statement for the record. And without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walker, thank you today for your testimony also. Uh, just uh, a, several questions I'd like to, to go through with you. Uh, what steps can the Postal <coughs> Service take to ensure that their e-commerce activities uh, will result in a positive return on investment? And how long can the Postal Service pursue these initiatives if they don't make money? Mr. Clay, I'd be happy to provide something for the record on that, but I, I, would, uh, I, I can't answer it uh, right here at this time. Do you know how much money they're losing on these activities? On the e-commerce activities, I, I don't. Okay. We just recently received some information. I think one of the things that has to happen in general in government, in general, and including the Postal Service, is to move more towards activity-based costing where you know, we have more information like this with regard to types of products and services and functions. Uh, the Postal has more than most, but not enough. Along those same lines, uh, how much money is the Postal Service counting on from its new products and services? Mr. Clay, I would respectfully suggest that they'd probably be in a better position to answer that than I would. Okay. Uh, last September, GAO made several recommendations to address a number of inconsistencies and problems. It found with the information the Postal Service provided on its e-commerce activities. What actions has the Postal Service taken to respond to GAO's recommendation? If you would, if it's all right, Mr. Chairman, I would like uh, Bernie Arnger to come up, who I think sure. held his hand up earlier, uh, who leads our work in the postal area, and he might be able to address it. Uh, Cummings, as you indicated, we did make uh, three recommendations to the Postal Service. Mr. Uh, Mr. I think Clay. one of the most uh, important ones was for the Postal Service to uh, get a better handle on its revenues and expenses from its e-commerce products. Uh, the Postal Service uh, did agree with our recommendation, all of our recommendations, that one in particular. It has taken action to implement a, a new uh, uh, system to collect and, and allocate uh, cost and, and, and uh, report revenue. We just got information recently from the Postal Service, so we haven't had a chance to assess it yet, but we're certainly pleased that they took our recommendation to heart. So do you think they'll make money off of, it, off <laughs> of their, their activities? We're, sti we're still analyzing that. The, the information to date would suggest they're still having problems making money, uh, but uh, again, uh, we're in the early stages uh, at this point. I see. Thank you. Uh, for uh, for mis Mr. Walker, uh, the Postal Service was recently chastised for approving over $200 million in bonuses for managers. 
How typical is this sort of behavior when every dollar is needed to cover necessary and critical expenses? I'm not intimately familiar with uh, the bonus system that the Postal Service has. I do, however, know that it's my understanding that it's based on somewhat of a balanced scorecard approach. Uh, it, it, is, it is based upon specific measures that are set in advance uh, that includes uh, results, that includes financial performance, that includes uh, on-time performance, that includes uh, certain employee-related issues uh, as well. Uh, in, in the private sector, generally, you would find that it's important to have a well-defined plan that has balanced scorecard measures, that considers profitability, but also considers other factors like productivity improvement, et cetera, which I know there's a heavy weight on at, at, at the Postal Service. Uh, we'd be happy to take a look at it if you, if you like, Mr. Clay, but uh, it, it's my understanding that it's, that it's a plan that's existed for some time. Uh, it's not unusual to see bonuses paid uh, in the private sector uh, when a company is losing money. Uh, and, and because it depends upon whether it's intended to be a profit sharing arrangement or whether or not the bonus structure is based upon other measures that even though they may not result in immediate profit, may end up resulting in positive outcomes over time. But, but without reviewing the exact program, it would be tough for me to tell you where I think so, there's, where there's stacks so, up. So, uh, irrespective of the three billion dollar deficit that's being projected. Uh, it's okay to pay the bonuses is what you're saying. What I'm saying is is merely because they're paying bonuses doesn't tell doesn't tell me that there's a problem. Uh, what I would want to do is to look at what is the nature of the bonus program, uh, how uh, how is it set up, what are the key measures, how where are they defined, how reliable is the information, and how do these bonuses compare to, you know, uh, to, to other you know, comparable entities, if you will. Okay, Mr. Walker, one final question. The Postal Service has reported that its worker compensation expenses are increasing substantially and difficult to control. Why are these costs increasing so dramatically, and what are efforts are underway to bring them under control? I uh, think that uh, the Postal Service would be in the best position to answer that, but I will tell you this. We, are, we do have concerns about uh, this issue. We do have concern about the so-called lost days rate. Uh, how many lost days uh, does the Postal ser Service have on average per worker per year? As you probably know, Mr. Clay, Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill is uh, a big proponent of focusing on these issues, and as I am, and, and he, this was one of his lead efforts when he was Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Alcoa. Uh, I think that's an area that clearly has to be focused on to a greater extent. It also could be a combination of, you know, uh, uh, of what's occurred over years when, when, when there hasn't been as positive labor management relations over, over a number of years uh, and, and possibly some of the stress factors or whatever. Bernie? Yes, sir. Uh, last year, one of the major reasons for the increase was a, uh, an effective speed up by the Department of Labor in processing claims. Uh, we also have just begun work at the request of Mr. Horn uh, to look at the workers' compensation program, so we're also trying to get a, a handle on, um, uh, you know, what is actually causing those uh, problems or the increases and what can be done to uh, prevent uh, the increases. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Mr. Walker, or General Walker, thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll be probably back in touch with you in the future. Uh, Postmaster General uh, Henderson, would you come forward? I understand you have an associate with you who may want to answer some questions as well. <clears throat> as always, we'll swear you in before you sit down. We swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you out. Have a seat. Make no mistake about it, uh, those members who are not here will be aware of uh, everything that's said, and there will be some of these members coming back. Uh, this is uh, Wednesday, and we're going on a two-week break, so there'll probably be a lot of the members who will be leaving. But uh, this is uh, very important, and the gravity of the situation with the post office will be conveyed not only to the members of the committee who aren't here right now, but to uh, the leadership and to the White House. I intend to contact the White House because I'm not sure they're aware of uh, of the shortfall, and I, 
I was just informed, and maybe you can address this in your opening remarks, uh, General Henderson, uh, that the uh, shortfall of uh, two to three billion dollars may be underestimated. It could be as high as uh, four to five billion, from what I've been told. So, if you could address that in your opening remarks, I'd really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today to talk about the Postal Service. I'm uh, I'm pleased that after uh, 30 years of working in the Postal Service. Uh, Next month I'll be leaving. I want to thank you for your help in trying to push reform and Ch former Chairman McHugh's help in trying to push reform. I think that's critical to the future uh, of the Postal Service. I also want to thank the 800,000 employees across America who work for the Postal Service for their outstanding customer satisfaction scores of 92 percent uh, customer approval. That's the highest in the federal government and also for their on time service performance with externally measured uh, first class mail, which is 93 and for 14 quarters uh, has been 93 or better all across the nation. And that's that's excellent work that these employees uh, do. Uh, my uh, disappointment uh, as tenure of Postmaster General is the fact that we didn't get postal reform. Uh, we've talked about what's happening today uh, for the last, what, four or five years. Uh, we've talked about the fact that there's going to be a decline in demand for postal products one day. And the Postal Service has to be given tools to avert that. Uh, I've been in this in Congress talking about this theme, and today uh, you're seeing it as a reality. I'll put up a slide, the slide number one. I'll just show you something that drives postal costs. It's something, Mr. Chairman, that you mentioned earlier. If you look at that graph, would you open it up here? I can't see it. Looks like a postal meeting. You can see that uh, the red line is the cost per work year, and the net and the yellow line is the net income. There's a direct correlation between cost per work year in the Postal Service and net income. If you take revenue per piece, which is the price of postage, and go back 30 years, you'll see that the price revenue per piece tracks identically to the cost per work year. So there's the driver. Now, if you'll go to slide two. You, you'll see that uh, the yellow cylinders are the actual growth, and the red part is the is the plan growth. And you'll see that AP five, six, and seven. That's after the rate increase. You'll see that by, that revenues were well below plan after the rate increase. If you'll go to slide three. The point of this slide is that over the last two years, we've, uh, we're processing 8 billion more pieces of mail, 3.1 more deli uh, million deliveries, with 20,000 20, less employees. So you can see the impact of automation on the Postal Service. And finally, the last slide. This is a slide that explains exactly where we are today. The yellow line is where we projected the $480 million loss. You see the top line. When we received the opinion from the Postal Rate Commission, we adjusted that line to $1.3 billion, accounting for the $800 million that you mentioned in your opening statement. When we had actual performance in quarter one, which is the green line, you'll see that expectations for revenue were very low. Now, we're projecting out between two and three billion dollars right there. But if the economy goes south, even from where it is today, postal mail volume is a surrogate for the economy. It could be worse. And I just want to be candid with you. Uh, we can't do much about that revenue line as it stands today. There, we don't have any tools really to affect the revenue. We just have to adjust our costs, our expenses. That's where you see some of the uh, what would be characterized as more radical things being talked about. Uh, we have to respond to lessening revenues. And we talked about this as being a major problem in the reform hearings that uh, former Chairman McHugh conducted. The fact that, you know, if it's uh, today it happens to be the economy, tomorrow it could be bills and payments of $17 billion being taken away from, from the Postal Service. It has to have tools to adjust. And uh, Without those tools, unfortunately, rate increases come along. 
the Postal Service is a matter of policy doesn't like raising rates. And we, we have some options that we are going to look at uh, for this uh, upcoming talked about rate case. But nonetheless, the problem exists. The problem of declining revenues is a fact in today's economy. So that's, I know you understand this uh, because you've been a part of that discussion. And that's where we are today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You know, uh, I know how hard you've worked trying to get postal reform through. And uh, a number of us in the Congress have been supportive of what you wanted. Uh, we haven't uh, always been able to have the kind of uh, bipartisan support for one reason or another. And I'm not blaming Democrats or Republicans. I'm just saying it wasn't there. Uh, Congressman Waxman and I think Congressman Davis, as well as the Republican Congressman, I think are more committed today to reform. We're a little bit late, but hopefully we can get something done. But I, w I wanted to point out to you something that I just saw today. This, have you seen one of these? What is it? It's, it's a device that uh, you can email from anywhere in the world. You can just yeah. carry this with you. And if you want to send a message to your wife or your girlfriend, I guess, or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> or, Chairman, oh, yeah. I'd like the record to reflect that I do not use that to send messages no, I, to my I'm girlfriend. Sure I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you Only don't. official do. No, emails are easily traceable anymore, as you know. But in any event, uh, in any That's event. precisely the point. <laughs> in any event, with this kind of technology, uh, it, it seems that, and, and I will be expressing this to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, with that kind of technology, uh, the Postal Service is, is definitely in a, in a very competitive area. And the thing that troubles me, and maybe you can explain this a little bit, is uh, <clears throat> you're talking about losing, I guess, some market share now. Uh, you're talking about uh, declining revenues, probably in part because of the economy. But with these kind of technologies, uh, and not only emails, but uh, with faxes, if they raise postal rates, let's say another two cents a, a, a letter or for first class mail or four cents or, or whatever you, they decide to do, is it not logical to assume that more people will be sending emails, which is much less costly, or faxes, which are much less costly than to just continue to buy stamps because the cost, and, and won't more businesses start doing that? Well, I think, I think the, uh, the general trend, regardless of the rates of postage, is going to be to use more electronic services as opposed to hard copy. Uh, there is, though, the, the very effective ad mail, standard A advertising mail, that's, uh, there's a lot of technology around that, and that's going to grow uh, remarkably, I think, because they can still reach your mailbox. They have a lot of data about you. It has high privacy to it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it has a, a terrific prospects for the future. Packages, we still uh, are the cheapest uh, available package, residential package delivery, uh, pickup uh, and delivery uh, organization in the United States. So I think there's opportunities there. I, the elasticities uh, based on pricing, they are sensitive. I mean, if you look back at every rate case, all except for the one that we raise rates across the board 10.3%, uh, volume has declined before it came back. And so there is a concern there about that. No, you still have something there, by the way. Uh, he was just pointing out, my assistant here, uh, uh, standard A mail is uh, 17 cents. That's right. And it's much less profitable than uh, the first class mail. Well, it has, it, it, uh, yes, in terms of total profit, not margin, but in terms of total monies we get from it. Yeah, that's one of the phenomenons we're happening right now, is that we're trading what was our growth product, uh, first class mail, 34 cents, for 17 cents at standard A. So we're delivering mail to your mailbox. It's generating a lot less revenue for us, and that's a big concern. Well, if you raise the rates on that class of mail uh, 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 as well as first class mail, won't that cause uh, a potential decline in, in the that uh, revenue source as well? That's right. There is a potential decline, but that's the only tool, uh, absent rate reform, I mean, that's the only tool that, that the governors have uh, to ensure the uh, fiduciary 
responsibility that they've been entrusted uh, by the president. That's that's the one tool they have. I mean, we can we can cost cut our way. We can close. You know, if you look at post offices, there's opportunities there. Uh, Twenty six thousand smallest post offices in the United States. It takes uh, over two dollars to take in a dollar. Uh, there's you know there's opportunities. You got some places like Cape Cod where you've got seven townships and 53 post offices. So there's some infrastructure inefficiencies. Yeah. But, 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 but those are, those are stopgap measures, are they not? I mean, that's right. Well, I mean, that's a one-time thing. You might save right. a billion dollars in one year or maybe a billion and a half, but the problem is going to continue. And once you've uh, uh, eliminated that problem, you're still going to have the revenue drain you're talking about. That's right. You've got to have reform. Well, well, let, me, let me just ask you, uh, and, and we're trying to figure out how to put together a bipartisan package. You know, the Postal Reform Bill, H.R. 22, didn't get the support that it needed for a number of reasons. Should have, but it didn't. So we're going to try to come up with a different approach. So I want to ask uh, uh, one other question, and that is, we were talking about automation. And, and new technologies uh, helping replace the uh, huge amount of revenue that's paid for uh, personnel. And what I was suggesting earlier is that 75 to 80 percent of the costs are personnel costs, personnel related, retirement benefits, health benefits, as well as salaries. Um, if everything, if, if you had everything the way you wanted it, if everything tomorrow could be changed the way you wanted it, could we, through retirements and normal attrition, transfer to a more automated system so that uh, we'd still have the postal delivery system, but, but through a more automated system as far as handling the mail is concerned, that would be able to generate enough savings so that we wouldn't have to have these postal rate increases? It depends on, the, uh, <clears throat> it depends on what the outcome of binding arbitration w uh, is on your, your remaining workers. Uh, we have huge effort underway for automation. In fact, if you look at letter mail, mail processing costs, that's where the focus has been with the billions of dollars. You'll see that the actual costs are declining in that area. Uh, but you, if you're going to get wage increases at four or five or six percent annually and keep doing that, uh, it's just like, you know, going from a push mower to a riding mower but paying three times as much money. You're not actually saving. You're not netting out on the bottom line. So. Uh, it, you have to get a handle on your work hour costs. So you're suggesting what in, in the area of binding arbitration? Well, I think there ought to be an alternative to binding arbitration. Such there's as? Several, well, there's the Railway Labor Act. Uh, you could think up a new way of, of, um, of settling disputes. I think that the voice of the customer needs to be heard in the outcome of a labor dispute and, uh, and not just uh, a party, uh, an arbitrator saying, hey, I'm cut the baby 50-50 or I'm going to give them the average wage increase uh, across America. I think that that process needs to be re-examined and re-looked at. And I think labor's voice needs to be heard. I'm not, I'm not knocking collective bargaining. I think collective bargaining is important. I'm just trying to figure out a new way to resolve the dispute process that doesn't result in these extraordinary work hour increases that, that drive rates. Okay. Uh, have, do you mind if I continue uh, for a bit? Have you, have you discussed with uh, the labor uh, managers or labor leaders in the Postal Service uh, the problem that they're facing with alternative sources of correspondence and how that will affect them if there isn't some kind of change in the binding arbitration? Well, I've, I've talked to them about the future. I mean, being priced out of the marketplace. I mean, we've seen in, 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 in industries like the auto industry where many companies are going offshore. Now, you're not going to go offshore. Well, you might even go offshore with some of the competition that's coming into this country and opening up facilities, which was mentioned earlier, but uh, but you're not going to go offshore for, for building a, a, a post office like we do a car, but devices like the one that Congressman Barr has are becoming more and more in vogue and people are using them, and if, if the labor force continues to price itself up, thus driving the cost of the service up, it seems that more and more people will be turning toward these alternative sources of communication. Has anybody, yourself included, discussed, sat down and had long discussions with the uh, leaders of the unions about how this would affect them? Yes. Uh, our labor union leaders are well informed. In fact, they write about it in their magazines about the future of the Postal Service and the need for postal reform. I wouldn't say that there's any agreement on an alternative to arbitration. 
uh, they are very concerned, and I don't mean to speak for them, but they're very concerned about the notion uh, of eliminating collective bargaining. They are very much opposed to that, wouldn't support anything like that, and we're not proposing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are concerned about the future, and they do understand postal costs intuitively. Do you, uh, well, that, that, it seems like to me that's uh, kind of like the Gordian knot that Alexander the Great had to face. I'm not sure what the answer is, but uh, uh, it seems like to me if, at some point that's going to be one of the things we're going to have to sit down and figure out, and we'll try to talk to uh, Mr. Gould and some of the other people who are in charge of the various unions and see what their suggestions are on, on how to deal with that. And your successor, whoever it happens to be, we'll try to have them in the loop, too, and maybe get everybody together. As I said earlier in our opening statement, it's extremely important that all segments of the, of the postal community, not only the postal unions and, the, and the, the people that run the post office and the Postal Rate Commission, but also those who are involved in competition that would be affected by postal <coughs> reform legislation need to sit down and try to, to work out their differences. Let me just ask a couple more questions here, and then I'll uh, yield to uh, my colleagues here. Do you agree uh, with the decision by the Comptroller General that uh, to add the Postal Service to its high-risk list right now? I, I agree with uh, Mr. Walker in adding the transformation process. It, he didn't add the Postal Service. He added the, the Postal Transformation process right. to his high risk, and I think he should. I think uh, the efforts that that we've had in postal reform and the, and the fact that uh, we haven't been able to achieve reform uh, and the conditions today and looking into the future, I think it warrants any help we can get. I mean, I'm, I'm open for anybody to get on this bandwagon. <laughs> Do you have any other recommendations on, uh, to make to the Board of Governors or the new Postmaster General on what kind of actions can be taken to, to get the Postal Service off of the, that list and, and uh, get things moving in the right direction? Well, I, I think it's going to take a cooperative effort between uh, the management of the Postal Service, the Board of Governors, and the Congress, uh, which plays the, the moving role, to come up with a strong bipartisan piece of the legislation that will help the Postal Service and that it moves through Congress with, with, uh, with the support of the American people. And, and we can't do it by ourselves. We've shown that. Uh, we have also some legal restrictions. Uh, and, and thus far, until you have a problem, it doesn't seem that people want to sit back and take notice. I think if they get rate increases uh, in the summertime uh, or, or a proposal, I think people will really take notice. Well, I, they I, 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 before I yield to my colleagues, let me just say that, uh, uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the uh, legislative process is we usually don't uh, respond until there's a, a shrill cry from someplace. Uh, and we should be a little bit more for, far-sighted, but unfortunately it seems like we aren't. Uh, Mr. McHugh down there has been working on this and talking about this for a long time, as we've said, and, and uh, it's fallen on deaf ears. Now we're into almost a crisis situation. Mr. Barr, do you have any questions right now? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Postmaster General, I appreciate your being here, and again, I'd like to tell you as I directly, as I said earlier, and I mean very sincerely, I do think we have the best postal service anywhere in the world. I'm very familiar, having lived in other countries, worked in other countries, uh, that, that ours is better by far than almost any other, and certainly better than every other. Uh, and uh, my experience, uh, having been a, a temporary uh, carrier during <laughs> college, uh, uh, is very first-hand knowledge, uh, and that continues to this day. I meet frequently with uh, postal employees and postmasters in the 7th District of Georgia. Uh, and from time to time where we have a problem in management or with employees, uh, in my experience, uh, the Postal Service has always been very receptive to working with us and working with the particular uh, post office to straighten it out. Uh, my concerns, uh, like yours, are certainly not with the employees themselves. Uh, they do an outstanding job under very difficult conditions sometimes. Uh, but I, I share the concerns of, uh, of other members of this committee, and I think the general public, uh, with some of the things that, that we're seeing, we're reading about nowadays. Uh, and it's not something new. I pulled up uh, in, uh, in our computer system a letter that I had recalled writing back in 1997 uh, uh, to uh, Chairman McHugh. Uh, and this was in response to a news report back in uh, the middle of 1997 about the new postmaster in Atlanta throwing a party uh, for herself, uh, costing $45,000. Uh, it's that sort of uh, abuse of, uh, of the public's monies uh, 
uh, that give us concern, uh, then I just saw, as I'm sure you have, uh, uh, this article from just a couple of months ago about uh, Postal Service executives using chauffeur-driven limousines. Uh, I appreciate your comments on, on that, whether that uh, has been cut out completely. Uh, and then also, if you could comment on, on the reports uh, that I, I alluded to earlier with regard to uh, the possibility of cutting back Saturday delivery. Uh, I think that if there's one thing that the Postal Service could do that would guarantee its demise, it's cut back uh, or eliminate service on Saturday. Uh, I can't understand why something so self-destructive would even be considered, and I certainly understand that you all have to look at cost-cutting measures. Uh, certainly, that's, uh, that's important. Uh, and from time to time, you have to consider raising the postage rate. I think all of us understand that. We may not always agree with the amount or the timing, but I certainly, for one, understand that that does have to happen from time to time. I also understand that many of your costs, not all of them, but uh, much, many of your costs are beyond your control, the cost of fuels, for example. So I commend the Postal Service for exploring ways to uh, streamline its operation, encourage you to look at uh, other ways of doing so, but I would uh, urge you to look at constructive ways of saving money, not self-destructive ways. Uh, again, I, I would think that looking at curtailing Saturday deliveries would guarantee that millions of Americans would seriously begin to look elsewhere for alternative ways to have their mails delivered. Uh, and I'd like to know what is the thought process that is going on that would lead to even considering something, something like, like that uh, given the, what seems to me, the obvious self-destructive nature of it. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the, the first few issues. Uh, with 80,000 people, um, 80,000 managers, 800,000 employees, you're going to have instances uh, of people abusing the rules or, or doing something that uh, they shouldn't do. And I can assure you that when that occurs, uh, we're working, we work very closely with the IG that we take immediate action if there's, if we have to change the rules, we do that. If we have to discipline somebody, we do that. If we have to fire somebody, we do that. So uh, we're going to have instances of that. We're not proud of those instances, but we we take uh, action uh, as a result of learning of those things. Uh, with regard to Saturday Saturday delivery, what we're going to do is is do an internal study to see how much uh, Saturday delivery actually costs us and uh, what savings are there. It's not a decision, the decision to curtail Saturday delivery has not been made. We've done this in the past. We did it in the 70s. In fact, in the 70s, I was a part of the task force that looked at, at uh, what Saturday de delivery costs us. And then we're going to talk to our board of governors. Uh, they've asked us to put a value on it, and we are. And, and uh, that's what they publicly directed us to do yesterday, and we will, our operating people will do that. But there's no decision made today to eliminate Saturday delivery. There are some constituents of Saturday delivery that have to be considered, some voices. <clears throat> uh, one are the newspapers. Uh, the newspapers rely on the Postal Service's Saturday delivery in many places. Uh, that's the only effective way they have of reaching their customers. There has to be some consideration of that. Another one would be remittance mail. Remittance mailers, uh, people who receive their bills on Saturday, are more likely to pay their bills uh, right away than those who receive their bills on Monday. That's a study that the remittance mailers have made. So there's obviously a financial impact on those folks. Those are things we, we are aware of, but we're, we're not going to be irrational here. Uh, uh, we're going to be prudent. And, um, but we do have a problem. I mean, I, we, we have a problem that our customers are saying, don't raise rates. Don't raise rates. Uh, and uh, we have to look at every possible alternative we have um, given the fact that uh, the real problem is a recession in which post the demand for postal products is declining. Mr. Chairman, could I uh, just uh, pose one quick follow-up question, please? Uh, I, I understand that, that the economy uh, does have uh, both an indirect and a direct bearing on, uh, on the, the manner and frequency with which people use the postal service. It's the same as virtually every other postal, uh, virtually every other service available to the public. Uh, and I, I don't think that looking at uh, Saturday, curtailing Saturday delivery is irrational. It's super rational, and that's the problem. Uh, it's looking at postal delivery in terms of nothing but dollars and cents, and therein, I think, lies the problem. Uh, you could look at 
uh, the dollars and cents of curtailing delivery every other day, I suppose, and one could come up with a super rational argument uh, that, hey, it makes sense to do that, let's do it. Uh, I think you're making a serious mistake even suggesting that you're gonna open that can of worms. Uh, it's already causing a, 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 maybe not a firestorm, but a lot of people to ask some very serious questions uh, about the Postal Service. It's drawing you know, a tremendous amount of attention to you, not all positive. Uh, and I think there's just so much room for improvement in other areas. Uh, why you would bite off that uh, at the beginning of this exercise uh, is something I don't quite understand. I, I, would, I would urge you all to move that off of the table, uh, look at these other areas, uh, and consider such drastic steps as, as curtailing Saturday delivery uh, way down the road, if at all. Uh, because you're doing more than just making some adjustments to save you money. You would be fundamentally altering what the Postal Service means to American citizens if you do that. And I think that would be a fatal mistake for the Postal Service to do that, and I don't think you ought to even Go, go down that road at this point, even, even studying it. Thank okay. you. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Henderson, let me um, commend you for what I think has been your ability to hold together a very complex system that was fraught with many needs and problems and while it's easy for people to throw darts from the outside, sometimes when you get on the inside, you see things a little differently. And I think that you've demonstrated uh, real management skill and insight in terms of being the, the, the keeper of a complex system and a complex process, and especially the fact that we have seen some improvements relative to on-time delivery. I, I, I commend you and your staff for the work that you've done. When we talk about change, and we talk about changes, and everybody's saying we need some legislative fix, um, one of the things I've also observed is that it's oftentimes much easier to say things than it is to do them. And that oftentimes, after all is said and done, more gets said than done. <laughs> and, 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 and so it's easy to talk about the fixes in your mind when we talk about legislative changes or restructuring. What, what comes to mind you would, would, would share? Well, I, I think the two big, the two big uh, targets, one is pricing freedoms, <laughs> and the other one is um, some solution other than arbitration to collective bargaining disputes. Uh, they're the two main drivers uh, of the Postal Service, and um, so those are two areas that uh, I think need attention. Uh, that We have talked about some other areas, like the ability to introduce new products in a rapid way. Uh, we have talked about the ability to use uh, our investment, our income for, more, for broader investments. Uh, if you look at the posts around the world, and I know, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that earlier, uh, you see a growing move to unleash these postal services, and I say unleash them because they go very aggressively into the commercial markets. I just had a meeting last week with Klaus Zumrickel, who is the head of the Deutsche Post. He's the largest logistics company in the world. He just bought the largest bank in Germany. Uh, he's got an express mail business similar to the Postal Services, and then he's got a mail monopoly. He owns 51 percent of DHL. Now, I'm not suggesting that we ought to become Deutsche Post, but I am pointing out that the world is really changing rapidly. And uh, we're, we're, we're like a third world country, Post. I mean, we've got these 31-year-old laws, and uh, people ask me from foreign countries all the time, why doesn't the Postal Service change its legislative construction? Why is it lagging behind the likes of Royal Mail and the likes of uh, the TPG, the Dutch Post? And I really don't have an explanation for them because they come over here and they say, you're destined for just higher prices. You, you know, we've, we've studied that model. And when I came into the Postal Service in 1972, we were the model for the whole world. 
we were, everybody was coming to the United States to see this new postal organization which was independent from, from government but still a, a part of government. And now they come here and they, and they are shocked. And some of the, my colleagues have, in foreign posts have been in a long time and they just don't understand it. And, uh, you know, I've been a voice for reform uh, until my voice has almost run out. And uh, I, I don't know what's going to precipitate it. I really don't. But I think those areas of pricing and, and controlling our labor costs are imperative. It seems to me that, that, that a part of our financial difficulty has come as a result of, of our inability to deliver on promised savings. I mean, where, where, where projections were made that we were going to be able to reduce costs and, and we have not been able to deliver on those promises. Could you share why we, we, we were? Well, we have done, I think, a better job than we get public credit for in terms of delivering services. I mean, we talk about labor productivity. Uh, we've had positive labor productivity in 1997, 1998, 1999. And in a year of declining uh, uh, mail volume, we have positive productivity. This year and last year, we had the pro highest productivity we've had in nine years. Uh, the difficulty is, is that your wage rates go up beyond your productivity levels, and therefore you net out at, at, uh, at a cost. And, and that, that is a fundamental issue with the Postal Service. Uh, and there's a lot of fixed costs, quite frankly, in the Postal Service. I mean, we come to your house, for example, we send a letter carrier by every day, regardless of whether they have 50 pieces of mail or five. When they have five pieces of mail, you lose a lot. When they have 500 pieces of mail, you make some money. So the infrastructure itself, it, it's a service to the American people, but it has built-in inefficiencies in it that you're not going to not get mail. I mean, I don't think anybody here is suggesting that we not deliver everywhere to everyone every day. And uh, in doing that, if you don't have a robust mail system, it, it, it loses money. And I'll give you another example of the business cycle. We make all our money in the first two quarters of our fiscal year. That's September through quarter two. So our fiscal year begins in September. We lose money the remaining two quarters of the fiscal year. And somebody says, well, why do you do that? Because mail volume dries up. The last two quarters of our fiscal year doesn't have the robust mail volume. It's like the water in your house, the water pressure going down and somebody saying to you, why don't you take out some pipes? Uh, you know, it's a fixed infrastructure, and uh, without robust volume, it's inefficient. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Otter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, he said no. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Henderson, I, I, I apologize for being gone while you were giving your testimony. However, I did uh, read your very informative uh, written testimony. And I guess uh, coming from Idaho, I'm no different than anybody else. You always hear from me when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't hear from me when I get all my mail, especially all my bills. Uh, then you don't hear from me. Uh, but those are the questions generally that uh, I think I'm asked. Uh, and I don't hear from anybody that says, geez, the post office did a great job for me today. I hear from them when they, when they say uh, that you're not doing a good job. Uh, but one of the, one of the questions that uh, I have relates to uh, my opening statement. And my opening statement referred to one of the highest cost or loss areas in the Postal Service seems to be the undeliverable mail, or mail not deliverable at this address. Uh, and uh, the figure that I had was $1.5 billion. Is, is, is that representative? Is that, that about that's correct? That's in the ballpark. Uh, and, uh, but this is not a phenomena that just happened in the last uh, few years. This is something that's been building, and, and so it's been part of that, uh, that uh, almost $10 billion in total net losses uh, that you're carrying on the books right now, isn't it? Uh, is that, is that? It's uh, net losses. 3.4 million. No, but aren't you, aren't you carrying a, uh, a uh, loss of, uh, in, I thought it was an excess. With this year, would have been pretty close to $10 billion. You're talking about the negative net income? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's got to be paid for. Right. Somewhere, sometime. That's right. Uh, 
Are you familiar with, uh, you, you talked about uh, the uh, Deutsche Post. Are you familiar with the program that they have, uh, the Siemens uh, group has, that re uh, has a national registry uh, for the change in addresses, that technology? Is that fast forward? Pardon me? Is it fast forward? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, now, that technology has been around quite some time, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and that technology seems to uh, at least avert ongoing costs that would add up to the $1.5 billion. Have you looked at that program? Well, well, those are two separate issues. Uh, undeliverable as addressed is mail that has the wrong address on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fast forward says, I'm going to move from Washington, D.C. to New York City. And fast forward, when, I, when the mail is addressed to me in Washington, D.C., will automatically rebarcode the mail and send it to uh, New York City. Undeliverable as address is just a service we provide. I mean, we try to deliver mail uh, as, as to the address on the envelope, and, and if that address is bad or doesn't exist, uh, we obviously can't deliver it. We have to dispose of it. But they're two separate things. They're not the same thing. Okay. Well, so then, so then, take me through how it adds to up, up to a billion five hundred million dollar loss. You've already it's, got the thirty-four cents for the piece of mail that wasn't deliverable. Does it cost you that to store it, or what do you do with it? No, it costs us that to handle it. It's, it's a cost to the Postal Service of handling a mail that's got a bad address on it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you when we accept it if it's a bad address or not, but when we, when we sort it, we, we can't find the address we have to handle. We dispose of the mail, but that's, in America, there's, what, 680, 30 million pieces a day. Uh, there's going to be some bad addresses in that volume, and, and that's just a part of the service we provide. Okay, uh, let's move on uh, then to another area that uh, is of cost, the 300 to 500 million dollars in, in advertising for a, uh, for a product of which uh, the post office enjoys a total monopoly. Uh, that number is not accurate. Uh, uh, what, what would the number be? It's 161 million and, it, and it's primarily devoted to the non-monopoly, the very competitive mail. And when we don't uh, advertise, the, our share of the market goes down. I mean, it's measurably goes down. When we do advertise, our, pro our products grow. Uh, so, I mean, it's an essential to stay competitive. And we've been doing this um, for years. I see. Uh, one other area I'd like to get into that I mentioned in my opening statement was uh, the byproducts uh, that, you, uh, that you produce, in including the internet high tech. How much has the post office spent to get into the uh, email? Well, we email, we haven't, uh, we have our own email system, uh, obviously, that, that we use for inter office communications. Uh, and I couldn't tell you, I'll tell you for the record, or I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how much it costs to install that email system. But it, uh, it, it's a significant savings for us in being able to go to a computer and, and if I want to talk to my chief financial officer to be able to email. No, I, I understand that, Mr. Anderson. What okay. I'm referring to is you don't offer an email product available to the marketplace? Yes, we do offer a secure service to the, to the marketplace. Uh, Yet then isn't it your testimony also that, uh, that one of the things cannibalizing the first class mail system is the email? Well, Email is not having much of an impact on first-class mail because correspondence had gone away before email came along. I mean, there's an assumption, and I think a logical assumption that by most people, that email really banged us. Uh, it, it really didn't. Uh, people didn't write letters. By the time email came along, uh, people had, had virtually stopped writing uh, each other all across America. What email represents is a technology that really leads to electronic data exchange which b the B2B stuff, that has really been slowing down, and that has affected us, but not just the general email. But you're not offering that product? We offer a secure email. I think uh, Social Security is a, is a big, is the uh, major customer of that right now. We offer several varieties of, uh, we have a stamp, we offer secure document uh, services, and those sorts of things. And we have revenue streams from them, uh, because <clears throat> they have upfront costs, they're not profitable yet. But uh, we have been instructed by our governors to create P&Ls for all of them, and we implemented all the GAO's recommendations, so we're watching them very closely. But according to uh, our market research, they are promising, but they're not big deals. I mean, on a $67 billion base, these are very small initiatives. I mean, we are really focused on our core business, 
that's where the Postal Service is going to hang its hat. Not on their, we're actually learning. I mean, we have an e-bill pay service. And one of the reasons we got into electronic bill paying was to understand it better. Because it could, it's going to cannibalize the $17 billion of our core products, which is first class mail. And we do understand it a lot better right now uh, than we did before. And we see that it, it may not be the early threat that we thought it was going to be. But that's it. learning experiences for the organization are very important. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. McHugh. Bill, again, as I said earlier, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for the hard work you put forward. And uh, I know all of us on the committee wish you well in your, uh, in your future endeavors, whatever they may be. Some of us may envy your escaping this uh, current <laughs> milieu, but uh, you've certainly served your time and, and done more than your part. And uh, you'll go with our thanks. I do, one thing I'm a little unclear on, though, is part of your talk with uh, Mr. Barr. If the large newspapers want Saturday mail, does that mean we keep it or get rid of it? No, it doesn't mean we keep oh, it. I'm, okay. I was just, I, I was just uh, pointing out that I knew I have been talking to them, and I know that they're not very fond of it. I'm not that. sure how we'd vote on that. I just <laughs> want to be worried. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what Minister Otter probed you on. The, uh, and I heard you correctly, I believe, that the largest share of your mail advertising goes to your, to competitive. your competitive products. Right. But clearly there is some direction toward your first-class monopoly. Uh, what's happening to your first-class monopoly? It's eroding. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's virtually irrelevant. I mean, if you, if you were going to uh, invest in a letter delivery company today, you could not raise the venture capital to do it. There's just too many other investments that have greater returns. I mean, the margins on a 34-cent letter are, are fractional. So while we have protections that were relevant years ago, I think those protections today are not as relevant. Also, you have electronic alternatives, I mean, to that. I mean, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, Chairman Burton said, you know, it's free, virtually free, to send an email or to, to communicate with somebody electronically. Uh, that's going to occur. So the, the monopoly will be eroded over time. So if you're required to do something, even though I understand it's not your major portion of your budget, I, I don't think prudent business practices would suggest that you shouldn't advertise for something you're required to do and you're already losing money on it so you don't want to road share further. Would that be a fair that, statement? That's a, an accurate yeah, statement. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, beyond that, I'd like to talk a bit about potential savings. Uh, again, to Mr. Barr, I, can I assume you don't know what the cost of the actual cost versus the uh, the supposed benefits of delivery of Saturday mail are at this moment? Not, at this, not at this second, no. But I will know in a, within 90 days. So you're, you're, you're examining that as what I would think of be a prudent business practice to assess a very important part of your delivery system and find out what the, what the investment is versus the return. That's right. Let's talk about another part, another distasteful thing, but something that uh, I'm wondering if you're looking at. Uh, you're currently under a self-imposed moratorium on the closure of post offices that are operating. Uh, you are limited by statute from closing smaller rural post offices, something I'm very interested in solely on the basis of economic uh, concerns. Uh, has anybody looked at uh, perhaps streamlining those organizations and possibly assessing if that moratorium were to go away, what the cost of savings could be there? Yes, we are looking at that. We're looking at uh, the infrastructure and what we need uh, and what uh, 40,000 post offices cost us across the United States and how many do we need. I mean, you do most of your business in the, in the largest 7,000. The, the remaining post offices uh, are there as a convenience to America. And I, as I said to Chairman Burton, the 26,000 smallest offices of the 40,000, it costs over two bucks to take in a dollar. That's a very expensive infrastructure. Yet it's, it's a presence. I mean, I understand the, the non-economic side of it. People feel like they're losing their identity uh, when, when they uh, close their post office, their sense of history. I mean, the, the two things that Americans uh, dislike most in small and rural America, and you know this too, 
is the fact that when their newspaper closes or their post office closes, they feel like they've somehow lost. We understand that, but we have to examine every aspect of our infrastructure, what it costs, and then we have to talk about it with our customers and, and the pricing mechanism. Yeah. Right. And lastly, before my time runs out, you, you, you have recently made a commitment, for lack of a better word, to, uh, to uh, find savings in the elimination of 75,000 man years over the next five years. Uh, when 80% roughly of your costs are derived from the sole source, uh, I think it's logical that in desperate times you look at that kind of savings. But I don't think you lose 75,000 man years of service and not have some diminutive effect upon the, uh, the service itself. Uh, it, it, were you able to assess the, the trade-offs that are involved in that kind of action? Yes, we haven't done anything yet that would affect uh, the excellent service uh, that Americans get uh, all across this nation. We, we haven't done, and we, that would be a serious trade-off. And that's something, quite frankly, we were asked the uh, day before yesterday with our, by our governors, uh, we were asked uh, to say, what, what does it cost to have 95 percent, I'm using this as an example, 95 percent on-time delivery in Washington, D.C., whereas uh, uh, six years ago or seven years ago, it was in the 40s or 50s. Uh, you know, how, and here's one of the individuals here, our chief financial officer, who helped improve service in, in, this, in the Cap Metro area. So. We are going to look at all aspects of it. There's nothing sacred. There are no sacred cows in the Postal Service uh, going forward. But if I may, Mr. Chairman, one final question. I appreciate the, the committee's uh, patience. A lot of talk today about inefficiencies. I think I know you'd be the first to admit you can, you're trying, hopefully you will do better. And we need to be supportive of your effort there as well. But uh, just for those who may not know, what's the price of a first-class stamp in America look like compared to other countries, even those that have totally modernized and, and reorganized their, their uh, structure? Well, it's about half of what it is in Germany, as an example, and that's, that's held up as, uh, as the model for the world right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Half of what it is in Germany. Mm -hmm. hmm. Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Henderson. I just want to follow up with a few questions uh, regarding efficiencies at the post office. Um, the Postal Service has been investigating uh, automated sortation and information technology now for uh, quite a few years. However, we hear reports in the GAO that uh, the Postal Service has only increased its efficiency by about 10 percent over uh, the last three decades. Can you, can you uh, give <coughs> us an update on uh, what's happening with that process and why, why efficiency hasn't uh, moved any quicker than it has. That and indice that, that, that the GAO is talking about is a term, it's an indice that we created. It's called total factor productivity. It's not labor productivity, it's total factor productivity. And it really measures the health of an industry. It doesn't measure, it, it, it doesn't, total factor productivity takes into account labor productivity, but it also takes into account the uh, capital you invest and the, and the cost of supplies and services. So uh, it has an indice in it that, that, um, that's called labor productivity, and that's a, that's a gauge of our automation. If you look at, for example, the automation, uh, if you looked at the productivity level in uh, 1988 prior to automation and you looked at it today, <clears throat> and we had the same productivity today that we had in 1988 you have to add 100,000 workers to the role for the Postal Service. So automation has made a huge impact, but we also get 1.8 million deliveries a year additional in the Postal Service and have had for years. And if you say, what is that? That's that we're adding a city the size of Chicago annually. So there's a counterbalance there between growth in mail volume, which has been traditional up until this year, or, and growth in deliveries. Uh, you balance that with what you're able to take out in automation. If you look at uh, the mail processing, uh, the, uh, the productivity of letter mail, that's primarily where these billions of dollars have been focused, you'll see that the actual costs in mail processing of letter mail are declining. That's why you can have only a penny increase uh, in the price of first class postage. Okay, well you, you, you talked about, you know, you said, well, we've, we've also been picking up more volume of work, but in 
this U.S. News and World Report article that, that's been passed around that people have been talking about. Your workforce has grown, which of course it needs to grow, I mean, but it's grown to 900,000, which this U.S. News article says is the second largest workforce in America by buying Walmart. Now, what I want to ask you is, I know you've partnered recently with FedEx, and I'm wondering, in that partnership with FedEx, are, uh, are you looking at uh, best practices regarding not only automation, but also labor, uh, sort of uh, handling uh, labor practices and, and how to make the whole process more efficient from top to bottom? Well, not with, not with, we do that as a matter of practice, but we, we don't have any agreement with Federal Express to do that. Our Federal Express agreement is essentially a transportation agreement. We, uh, we're, they, are, they will, in the future, uh, fly first class, express and priority mail, and, uh, and uh, we, in turn, allow FedEx boxes uh, to be uh, on postal property. And I will add there's no exclusivity to this. Uh, that uh, we'll talk to anybody. You, you'd who allow UPS to also have we, their boxes we, uh, on have your property. Open, we would likely talk to UPS if they wanted to talk. Okay, I was joking with you. <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> well, I, w I would suggest that uh, that I mean, obviously, looking at private industry again. This is just from the U.S. News article that was was sent around. It says labor costs, and everybody's talked about this. Eat up 76 percent of your revenues, which certainly understand the problems inherent there compared to 56% at UPS and 42% at FedEx. One final question I have has to do with um, your, your postal rate increases uh, for uh, magazines, and I, I, don't have, I don't have the information in front of me right now, but if I'm not mistaken, at the be beginning of the year, that rate increase shot up by about 10%, and there's now a proposal on the table to increase that another 15%. I mean, that's a pretty dramatic increase, almost, tw uh, well, not almost, that's 25% in about six months' time. That's, that's a heck of a hit for the magazine uh, industry, and more importantly, for, for consumers that are going to be paying more to get those magazines delivered, is it not? It is. It, it is a heck of a hit for the magazine industry, and we work with them, but uh, their costs are higher than the, than the other classes of mail, and that's that's unfortunate because if we had a, if we had a different uh, rate setting process, for example, magazines generate a lot of mail. They're they're at one point in a value chain. They have business reply mail inside of them. They have subscriptions that you you write oftentimes and send first class mail. But we have to treat them like a commodity, and and that's one of the fundamental flaws. You ought to be able to look at the value chain of these things that generate a lot of mail, and we're not able to under the camp current cost uh, setting regime. Well, I, I, I appreciate uh, your responses and appreciate your time here and would just suggest I really do think 25 percent increase in six months is, is a bit excessive. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scarborough. Mr. LaTourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. General Henderson. I, uh, I apologize. I had to go listen to the new Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Would, Mineta, would you put who's the doing mic a little closer to you? Next door. And uh, I did hear the opening statements of some of my colleagues, though, and I, anybody who wonders why you find yourself in, in this situation should have watched Ms. Wilhite on C-SPAN this morning, who did a great job for the service talking about the increase in fuel costs, the impact of technology on your, your mail volume, and, and some of the sag in the economy. I, I did want to go back to, to something um, that uh, Mr. Scarborough was asking about, because I think the last time you were before the subcommittee that doesn't exist anymore, uh, there had been some uh, news accounts and reports of the, the pending agreement with FedEx, and now we know that that's, that's gone forward. And if I could, I'd like to, to revisit just some of those issues. And, mm -hmm. and at, at that hearing, and I, I, sadly, I'm not one of those guys that goes back and gets a transcript, so we're going to have to re rely on my faulty memory, but I think I expressed some concerns about uh, the anti-competitive nature uh, of it, and I think you made the observation that you had a legal opinion at the time that indicated that it didn't have to be bid. There's now been litigation that confirms that position. Uh, but uh, I'm aware of, and I assume you're aware of, that some of your, your former regional carriers are making the observation that they could deliver the same service for less money. Uh, and, and the question I have to you, despite the fact whether you're right legally or, or, or not, and, and you clearly are, uh, if that's a, a valid claim, why? my question is, why would the, one of the largest contracts in the Postal Service's history, to my understanding, 
one, be of a seven-year duration, mm -hmm. uh, and two, not be opened up for competitive bids so that you could get the best price for the service? Well, we did ex an extensive evaluation of, of uh, Federal Express, and, and uh, we are in litigation, and, and so I'm limited in what I can talk about. But I can tell you that, that this is the best transportation arrangement that the United States Postal Service has ever had in its history. And uh, it's going to be terrific for the American people. Uh, priority mail is going to be uh, virtually 100 percent on time. Uh, I mean, it's a, it, it, trust me, it's a terrific deal. And, and, and I, Federal Express is a wonderful company. I'm not disparaging their ability to move things around the world in, in any way. But the, the, the question is, if, if in fact, I think the specific figure that I saw was something about a 35 percent savings. And so I, I, are you saying that because of the value uh, of having this on-time delivery, it, it doesn't matter what it costs, uh, or uh, that uh, the increased cost justifies the benefits, or are you disputing the fact that, in fact, these services could be obtained by the service for less money? Well, what we're saying is that uh, in the past, we've paid a fully loaded cost. In other words, it's, we've had to rent, lease a fleet. We pay for the whole fleet. Now we're, we have a variable cost. We don't have to lease a fleet. We're leasing space. It's the same arrangements we have with the airlines. I mean, if you look at flying mail at 28 cents a pound on a commercial airline as opposed to, to uh, at, at one point on our, on, uh, our leased airplanes, it was a buck. Uh, but we, with Federal Express, we get variable. We get the variable costs and not the fully loaded costs because they've got other things that they're charging against it. That makes it very uh, economic for us. It, it's, it's my understanding that, that uh, some of the terms of the agreement put a, a, a ceiling, if you will, on the amount of mail that Federal Express. I don't know the answer. If, if you could, and, and my specific question is, if there is in fact a, a maximum uh, that they're obligated to carry. It, it seems to me that in, in some of the literature, at least prior to this agreement, they listed the Postal Service, and the Postal Service listed FedEx as a, as a competitor, uh, and you were in, in certain product lines, that having a maximum obligation, uh, it appears to me, if that's one of the contract terms, seems to place in the hands of a competitor, a former competitor, uh, a, a great deal of, of power over the United States Postal Service. And so I'd be interested in the answer to that. And then and the last uh, observation that I, uh, if you can sort of dig up the uh, um, the answer to the, the question as well. I, at the previous hearing, we talked about having FedEx boxes on postal services. As a matter of fact, in my district office in Painesville, I can look out at this beautiful square. I see three mailboxes and I see one FedEx box. Uh, to follow up what Mr. Lotter had said, <clears throat> you said you did an evaluation, and I, and, I, and I have high regard for FedEx, UPS, all the major <laughs> deliverers, so I'm not picking on anybody, but uh, why wasn't there a competitive bid uh, on that contract that set out all the criteria that uh, that was that that you required, all the things that you required, and then when you got the bids, they, to 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 make sure that they could uh, meet all the requirements, uh, uh, or else the bid was null and void. There's a uh, a short answer, and then I'll provide for the record for you a very detailed answer. Okay, fine. The, the short answer is we did look at the competitive field. We had an evaluation by outsiders, experts, and really there was no one. Uh, and who, who were those outside people that made uh, the price, I think it was Price Waterhouse. Price Waterhouse Coopers, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, our transportation people felt very strongly that, that uh, it was going to be, uh, it was unnecessary. We litigated that. I mean, that was a complaint against us, and we won the litigation. It, it was a very thorough job that was done. Um, I mean, we think we have a wonderful partner in, in Federal Express, and as, as I said to Mr. LaTourette, it, it is the best transportation deal we've ever had in the Postal Service, both from an economic point of view, but more importantly, from a service point of view. This is going to take a product that uh, has been two to three days in the marketplace and, and make it two days 100 percent virtually, 100 percent of the time. Well, let, let me just... I mean, I was told, I don't know how accurate this is, but that the contract is around somewhere six to seven billion dollars. And according to, I guess, some of their competitors that have com contacted a number of us in the Congress, uh, two to three billion could have been saved if another carrier had had the contract. Is that a stretch? That's more than a stretch. That's a leap. Uh, there's no. Uh, well, there's just out of just out of curiosity, how, how, how do you know that? 
because we did an evaluation of we've been in the transportation business for a long time yes sir and and we have arrangements with a number of people all across America many of which are complaining now so we know their, their internal costs and and we know you know we, we understand the efficiencies of, of air transportation and I mean I can tell you and I'll provide you in writing sure uh, a detailed rebuttal to what those folks okay, are well, we, we like to have that for the record just so yes. we have all the facts straight yes. and I guess Price Waterhouse uh, uh, evaluated that as well I'll be happy to provide you that evaluation okay uh, we've asked many questions today about the Postal Service and how it could say it could have saved money in the past and where they might save money in the future um, hypothetically if your cost containment efforts uh, could save you three billion dollars how would that impact your decision to file a rate case this year it could if it could postpone the decision if you made three billion dollars in cost savings if you, this year if you got them mm -hmm. now you could actually postpone the rate increase but ultimately uh, it's a short-term fix ultimately sure. you need postal reform we need postal reform oh, I understand because we we talked earlier in the meeting today about uh, if you close down post offices and you went with the, what do they call those uh, several post uh, postal post office uh, several post uh, cluster boxes cluster boxes yes I'll thank you for helping me out there if you went with cluster boxes closed post offices uh, and uh, did some other economies uh, you could probably save uh, a one-time savings of a few billion dollars but that would only postpone the inevitable that's right it's not a fix I it's, it's what uh, uh, David Walker said from GAO uh -huh. there are some short-term fixes like raising rates or cutting costs, but long term, if you don't have transformation, and he calls it transformation, we call it postal reform. If you don't have postal reform, it's not going to fix the problem. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say that we're working on a postal reform bill that meets the problem, and we're going to try like heck to do that. In the interim, so that we don't cause some small businesses and other mailers uh, who are using the mail uh, a great deal, Postal Service a great deal to keep them from uh, either going out of business or, 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 or losing a great deal of profit and making them uncompetitive uh, magazines and other things like that uh, could the short-term economies you're talking about postpone it while the Congress tries to reach an agreement on a postal reform bill my own increase in my opinion it, it will not but uh, uh, that's certainly something we're going to we're going to look at some ways uh, John Nolan the deputy postmaster general is heading up an effort to look at some creative ways of, of getting finances with the rate commission without a huge rate increase now I don't we haven't completed those yet but we are going to work with the industry people like magazine publishers and newspapers and all to see if there's a way uh, this conversation came about uh, over the last several weeks uh, especially at the National Postal Forum where we had all of our customers and, and we are going to study alternatives here but we are in a we are in a vice right now we're in a box we have declining volumes uh, revenues way under plan and uh, the solution to price increases in the long harm long haul is to support your efforts in postal okay. reform uh, could you keep uh, mr. Davis and myself and mr. Waxman and mr. McHugh in the loop on that as well as other members of the Congress yes so that we can uh, uh, you know be as up-to-date as possible without having to have everybody come in for another hearing okay okay sir thank you very much thank, thank you, you. With us. we'll now call uh, our third panel uh, mr. David Fenneman the vice chairman of Feynman, excuse me, the uh, Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors and the following members of the board, and forgive me if I don't uh, pronounce this pro properly, Tirso Del Hunkel, is that close? Something like that. Pretty close. Alan Kessler, uh, Ernesto Ballard, and Ned uh, R. McWhorter. Would you all please stand and raise your hand? And I thank you for being so patient while we had everybody. Am I missing somebody? No, we, just a little bit. Just a little bit different. Mr. Walsh is here, and uh, former Governor McMurdo is not here. Okay, Mr. Walsh, we'll, we'll have you in his stead. Would you all stand and please raise your right hands, please? Yeah. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth of you got? I, I do. Uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Feynman, you're going to make the uh, uh, 
opening statement. Is that correct? Uh, That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Well, we got the name things. Uh, you got to change those for me, <laughs> so I don't call Mr. Kessler, Mr. Feynman, and vice versa. Okay, Mr. Feynman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me take this opportunity to, to first, before I say anything, to thank you for holding these hearings and to thank you for your interest in the Postal Service. Thank you for your interest in reform. Uh, Congressman McHugh, I want to thank as well, as well as Congressman Davis for their interest and their prior interest in reform. Um, I want to take one other opportunity to do one other thing. Um, one of the things that the Board of Governors does, maybe our most important thing, is the hiring and firing of the Postmaster General. And we are in the process now of looking for a new Postmaster General. And I want to take this public opportunity uh, with the Congress to thank Mr. Henderson for his years of service with us. And it clearly was a good choice for us to have made in the hiring of Mr. Henderson. Um, we have a prepared statement which I've given to you, and I don't want to reiterate that uh, at this late hour. Let me just take one minute, if I can, or a couple minutes, to tell you what the frustration is of being on the Board of Governors of the Postal Service and why we're coming here today to ask you for the necessary reform, much of which has been spoken about this morning. Um, and the frustration is actually a rate case. Uh, we've talked about what rate case could be. Let's talk about what a rate case was. The actual process, we begin by um, maybe six months ahead of time, we're now in that process now, of saying to the management, okay, let's go look and study what a rate case should be. Following that six months, you know, they come back to us, and over some period of time we meet, discuss the various rates, and then actually a truck pulls up to the post office, our offices, unloads tons of paper, and takes it over to the Postal Rate Commission. The Postal Rate Commission then holds hearings for about 10 months. Following that, a decision comes back to the Board of Governors, and then we have an opportunity to modify that decision. Let's look at what we did here. We sent that decision back to the Postal Rate Commission. And then what does the Postal Rate Commission do? It reviews that decision again, comes back to the Board of Governors. What does the Board of Governors have an opportunity to do? We can implement the decision, even though we might not necessarily agree with the Postal Rate Commission. And in this case, we sent it back to the Postal Rate Commission again for review. And then during that period of time, the Postal Rate Commission can send the decision back to us. And we're still waiting, actually, for the decision to come back. It's been over there about 30 days or so. Now, during that period of time, we have no power. We can't change our rates. Our hands, are, our hands are tied. There's no ability to run the Postal Service as you would run a private business. And at the same time, as you've mentioned before, the largest part of our costs are fixed by a third party. And under those circumstances, Mr. Chairman, we come to you and come to Congress and ask you please enact some legislation that gives us the power to do in 1971 what Congress said, which is to act like a business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, let me start off by saying uh, I, I presume that you sent to uh, previously Mr. McHugh and Mr. Davis your recommendations on how to streamline the process. I will say. You have? I, let, let me just say this, that um, I think that that's a fair question. Um, previous, in the previous, in, during the previous administration, I would say that the Board of Governors could not necessarily, we are appointed by various presidents, we're a bipartisan group, uh, the statute provides five of us be of one party, four of another, and there was no consensus that was reached by the Board previously. The letter which we sent to the leaders in Congress 
and to the President of the United States, set forth the views of all of the members of the Board as it's constituted today. In other words, it was, was it uh, individual views or the unanimous view of the, uh, of the Board? The letter that we sent uh, to the leadership and to, your, and to you and Mr. Davis and Mr. McHugh and all members of Congress, we assume, have it now, is the unanimous views of all the members of the board. Now, that letter, I don't have it in front of me, but does that letter spell out the, uh, the, the reforms that you think are necessary to make, uh, make this operate in a more efficient, business-like manner? I think what it does is it sets forth in general principle the kind of reforms that we think that are well, necessary. Let, let, let me suggest that and I suggested this in my opening comments today, that every segment of our society that's interested in the problems that we face needs to get to the relevant committees, in particular this committee, since we have the jurisdiction, the recommendations that they think should be incorporated into a postal reform bill. Now, we have a lot of good things in the bill that Mr. McCune and Mr. Davis uh, uh, fashioned, in the previous Congresses, but obviously there were some, some problems with that, otherwise we would have gotten it passed. So what we'd like to have is the direct mailers, the newspapers, the magazine people, uh, the Board of Governors, everybody tell us, you know, from their point of view, individually or collectively as groups, what you think ought to be in the bill so we can craft it as quickly as possible and try to meet all the requirements that, that are necessary to, to, to solve the problem and make this more more like a business instead of, uh, it sounds like a hodgepodge of things. I mean, I can't imagine you playing ping pong with those rate increases. That's what you were doing. They sent it to you, you sent it back. They sent it to you, you sent it back. I mean, th that obviously is not the way to run a business. There has to be a final decision-making process that's gonna, gonna stand. So uh, if you and your colleagues on the, on, on the board have some suggestions uh, as quickly as you can reach agreement. We'd sure like to have those. We will, we will submit them to you, Mr. Chairman. Would you do that? Yes, sir. Okay. What other questions do we have here? Okay. Uh, in an attempt to contain costs, has the board considered reducing the workforce through, att through attrition? Um, we have told management to go forward with every kind of uh, cost saving that they can attempt to reach. Uh, we obviously don't want to decrease service, um, but at the same time, we have put everything on the table, Mr. Chairman, and one of them, obviously, is reduction in our workforce, but we don't want to try to reduce service. No, I understand, but have, they ur have you urged and taken a look at automation and other new technologies that might be able to uh, not to take the place of, of people who are through attrition and through retirement? Sir, uh, are, are leaving to cut down the, uh, the cost, much like I said before when the auto industry went to robotics? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I mean, that is what, one of the things that we've done, and I think we, we can be proud of the automation system that's, that's come about. We've heard the Postmaster General talk about the productivity gains that we've had over the last year. I know, but I was wondering is, if there, is there more? That I, think that, I think that there is a higher bar that can be reached, and I think that I speak for everyone on this board um, in saying that to you, and that's the challenge that we've given to management. We'd like to have the recommendations for that as well. Uh, let me ask one more question here while I have the time. How frequently does the Board of Governors meet with the major mailers or trade associations that represent them? Um, I can't say that there are regular periodic meetings. Only recently, Chairman Ryder, who's not here today, and myself um, met with I believe to be virtually all the major mailers, mailers organizations, um, and to have a frank conversation with them. And obviously, they talked to us about rates. We talked to them about reform, and we had a very, very frank conversation. There was not a regular periodic meeting. I do personally believe that we have to reach out, and meet with those mailers on a regular basis, Mr. Chairman. Well, they're very concerned. A number of them, as you know, s smaller ones about going out of business because of the costs uh, getting out of control, and the larger ones are concerned as well. So we we'll hope you'll make those as frequent as you can. I know you've got a lot on your plate. Can I ask one more question, Danny? Uh, do you mind before I yield to you? Uh, the Postmaster General, uh, who we've all agree has done an outstanding job, has announced his requirement retirement. Uh, what uh, unique qualifications and leadership traits will the board be looking for when they select the next Postmaster, and when do you anticipate making an announcement? 
Well, we have no one right now. I want to make that perfectly clear. We are still in the process of interviewing. And when we leave here, uh, we're going to leave to begin some more interviews this afternoon. We conducted some yesterday afternoon. Uh, we've been working on this for some period of time. I think it's uh, probably one of the most difficult jobs in government. Not a whole lot of people raising their hand volunteering. We are trying to seek out the best person in government, the best person from both the private sector and government service who can lead an organization of almost 800,000 people, 38,000 locations, uh, and with all the problems that this committee has gone through earlier this morning into the 21st century. And I guarantee you that this is at the top of our priority, I'm Mr. I'm sure Chairman. it is, and uh, uh, since we're all trying to see more sound business practices incorporated into the postal system, I hope you'll look uh, long and hard at people in the free enterprise system who've shown uh, uh, superior talents in, in, in uh, using business practices to streamline businesses. You'll notice a lot of the major corporations, they'll steal a major executive from one to the other because they're so... Uh, so effective at uh, dealing with these these complex problems when we have so much competition. So uh, I hope you'll do the same thing. We will. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Feynman, let me uh, appreciate the work that you and your colleagues do as members of the Board of Governors. Let me also express some appreciation for the frustration which you amplified as you started your testimony. It does seem to me that it would be somewhat difficult to be part of a management operation but not really have the authority to, to make management decisions that impact heavily upon what it is that you do. So I think we heard you when you talked about the Postal Rate Commission and the relationship between the two and where the board sits in relationship to where, where they are. But let me ask you, in your letters to us, you've mentioned collective bargaining and compulsory arbitration as some concerns. Uh, let me ask what it is that you would hope to accomplish by raising that issue, and, and, and what is it that you think legislatively might be done that could alleviate whatever problems you, you, you see with the issue? Uh, Congressman, uh, you come from Chicago and I come from Philadelphia, and we could argue as to which town is more of a labor town, whether it's Philadelphia or Chicago. And my friends in the labor unions of Philadelphia, I'm sure, would argue hard for Philadelphia. There is no intention, and I want to make this perfectly clear, no intention on our part to take away from the collective bargaining process. Um, I believe in the collective bargaining process, as do my colleagues. What we are talking about is the third party arbitrator who makes these decisions in a vacuum. I think that there are various models that are out there that we should look at, and I say we collectively with Congress, as to what else can be done. You know, um, I'm a lawyer. Labor Law 101 kind of told us that, that when there is the friction between union and management, when they negotiate a contract, at the end of the day after they negotiate the contract, because they have risks on both sides, they probably walk out and they have better labor management relationships. And that's what I think we have to find. One of the things that Postmaster General Henderson mentioned was the Federal um, um, Railway Labor Act. I think that that's a good place to start, and that's the kind of thing that we're talking about, Congressman. Has there ever been, to your knowledge, any cost or amount put on the difficulties that we have experienced or continue to experience relative to labor management relations and, and, and how much time and how much energy and ultimately how much a cost of operating the system this becomes for us? I, I can't tell you with any specificity what it is, but there is not um, infrequently a board meeting 
where it isn't something that is discussed, the amount of time that people go spend at mediations, arbitrations, spend on grievances. Now, there is a great success story at the Postal Service, uh, one that's been modeled all over the United States, which is the redress system in which we try to mediate the differences between the parties before they get to the grievance stage. And it is a real success story as to how they've been able to lower costs. But obviously, it is a great cost, Congressman. So you're saying if we could get a better handle on that in all likelihood, we could actually save ourselves a great deal of, of money as well as time and other kinds of things. I believe so. And, and let me ask you, even though this was not a part of your testimony, but I couldn't help but be intrigued as we were listening to the discussion relative to the partnership with uh, FedEx. And I was trying to figure out how can we determine marketplace impact on ultimate cost unless we are negotiating with the marketplace as opposed to an entity within the marketplace. Would you have any? I, c I can only say that this board, uh, when the FedEx contract was uh, discussed with it, was as concerned about many of the things that the Congress has discussed as well. Um, as a result, uh, we decided that we would, we would hire our own counsel to look at that contract. Uh, we listened to the experts from Price Waterhouse. We look, listened to experts about a fairness opinion from Morgan Stanley. Uh, and we became convinced that it was the right thing to do. And I don't doubt any of the experts. It just seems to me that that's a concept in terms of free enterprise <laughs> that I have a little bit of difficulty understanding. But certainly, we'll get additional information, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have no for the question. I just have a couple more questions and I want to thank you very much for your patience. I know it's been a long day and and I know you get a little your your your, your rear end starts going to sleep after a while so I apologize for all this. We're still with you, Congressman. Okay, okay. I appreciate that. Um, I I was that saying the mind can't focus on things that the rear can't uh, can't tolerate something like that. Uh, there's, there's, there's a potential rate increase pending now. You've played ping pong with it. Uh, the economies that we've talked about today, that uh, the postmaster talked about, uh, uh, could uh, affect the profitability of the post office or non-profitability of the post office. Is it, is it absolutely essential that there be a rate increase in the not too distant future? Or can this be handled uh, through uh, uh, economies in the post office while we try to fashion some kind of a, a, a solution here in the, in the legislative branch? We're going to attempt, attempt to do everything we can not to have a rate increase. Okay. But on the other hand, if it's absolutely necessary, we'll go forward with it. We're going to do what we have to do in our fiduciary obligation. I would, one of the things that I heard some of the congressmen talking about earlier is the fear that I have. Um, and, and it's the system that doesn't provide any solution for us. Because the fear that I have is that if we impose a rate increase and then we deplete the amount of mail that we have, this is only a spiral that we can't get ourselves out of. That's absolutely right. When we met with the, um, with the mailers, you know, and they're begging us that their companies are going to suffer as a result of a rate increase, I feel for them. And that's, that's the question of reform. That's the question as to why we need reform. And the other part of it is that we can't do this under present statute. We have no choice because we have this cost-based system, so we can't do anything on a, with a market-based system. And it is a frustrating position to be well, in. The, the and, I, and, and I feel the pain to some degree that the, <laughs> that the mailers have. And I want to feel their pain, and I say to them, I want you to sit in my seat for a minute as the steward here and not roll up this deficit. But we will attempt. And what we've done before, I think you've got to remember something. What we've been able to do before, and when we talk about a rate increase, we're talking about make one of the, one of the things that this system does allow us is that when 
we propose rates to the rate commission. It will take them almost 10 months to get back to us. And then we have a choice as to when we impose the rate. The rate's not going to be imposed at the time we make the submission to the Postal Rate Commission. And we will do everything in our power, particularly if some of the reforms that we, or some of the measures that we've asked management to reach out for can be implemented within that period of time. I think the point that you've made, we've made, and has been made over and over okay. again, and that is, and the analogy was the car business, if, you, if, you're, if you're having a problem, you're lacking sales, and you're lacking revenue, if you raise the price, you certainly aren't going to solve the problem. You've got to compound it. And I'm afraid that that might be what you're talking about. But we're going to try to talk to the White House, and I hope you will as well, and the new postmaster will as well, telling them that this is a problem that needs to be addressed by not only the legislative but the executive branch and some leadership to, to really try to force this issue. Let me ask one more question, then I'll let you go. Has the Postal Service generated a net profit from its e-commerce initiatives? Do you know? like its e-bill pay, pay program? At, at this point, I can't tell you that we have. I mean, w at the numbers that have been given to me by management so far indicate that there are losses. The losses are small in relationship to the general sure. revenue of the Postal Service, but they are not profitable at this well, point. Well, any information you could give us uh, on, on that or anything else that you think might be a hel helpful solution we'd like to have. Do any of the rest of you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, uh, we appreciate you all being here. You, sir? Mr. Davis, anything else? Chairman, if you're about to wrap up, I'd just like to make sure that we have unanimous consent for Mr. Towns to submit uh, his remarks for the record and that we can have unanimous consent to keep the hearings open so that individuals who had questions sure. and were not yeah, here can get those submitted. Yeah, without objection, so ordered. And uh, the record will remain open, and we'll ask if we, if members have questions, if we could submit them to the people who testify today and we look, have answers in writing. We look forward to answering. And thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. We'll continue to work with you to solve this problem. We stand adjourned. Excellent. C-SPAN.